All right, this meeting will now come to order. All, um, Monita, can you call the roll? Randy Brockway? Here. Lisa Gaynor? Here. David Kadama? Here. Um, Arthur Perry? Present. Mary Rose Mangia? Here. And for the record, Mrs. Morello and Mr. O'Brien will not be in attendance tonight. Okay. All rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Um, I'd like to start with uh, public comment. Rory, um, and again, everybody please speak into the microphone. Uh, thank you. Hi, my name is Rory Dominic. I live at 3 to 8 Kent Road. I have two boys that attend Blythe Park School. Um, as most of you know, I've been actively involved in the discussion on professional development, and I worked with other parents on the instructional time committee that was formed. It's no secret that I support the early release plan, and I'm confident our administration will demonstrate tonight where they intend to make up these lost minutes throughout the remainder of the school week. I also trust the staff will go into negotiations for 2015, ready to work professional development into the collective bargaining agreement in a manner that does not pull directly from Instructional Time Weekly. Tonight, I specifically wanted to pose a question to all of you and to the community at large, as I have repeatedly heard among board members and community members that the April 15th vote on early release was a false choice and that there was false information presented. Do you believe this information was falsified on purpose, or would it be more appropriate to characterize it as an error? As a result of this error, some board members have indicated their decision was based on false data, and therefore their vote may have changed. But let me ask you, had you been given 100% accurate data regarding neighboring districts' early release late start program, would this really change your vote? It made me think about why are we looking at early release? Is it because other districts are doing it or not doing it? No. We are looking at this aggressive approach because District 96 is behind in Common Core training. What other districts are doing or not doing with early release or late start seems somewhat irrelevant and should certainly not be the driving force for a decision. The real question we should be asking is where are these other districts in the implementation of Common Core compared to District 96? While I don't have a presentation to share with you, I can tell you based on the research I have done that most, if not all of those districts we are comparing ourselves to are ahead of District 96 and Common Core. In most cases, they have been working on this for three years. District 96 is on year one. Please ask yourself as board members, did you vote on this matter based on what other districts are doing? Or did you vote on this matter based on the fact that District 96 staff need professional development and early release was the most cost-effective way to accomplish this task. As a parent, I'm not concerned about what other districts are doing or not doing with an early release program. What I care about is are my children getting a quality education on par with our peer districts. I've re received repeated qu questions from other parents asking what is this false information. If it is nothing more than a list of districts and what their PD program is or is not, and there was an error on it, Please don't bring this into the discussion as it's complicating an already volatile situation. I think we would all agree the question is really about where is District 96 on Common Core training versus other districts. The false choice we all were given was compliments of Lamberson, who failed to implement any training of Common Core during his time, despite repeated requests from the board and the staff. In closing, I ask all of us to work together so that we can continue to bring District 96 to a place of excellence. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rory. Uh, Chris, uh, um, I just want to make sure everybody understands there is no voting item on the agenda for um, early release. So just, so thank you. Uh, Kristen, please. Kristen Evans, I'm the parent of two at Ames School. And Mary Rose, thank you for the clarification. However, despite that we vo the vote was taken in April, the conversation has continued for two months. So what I wanted to say today is that, um, just that I'd like to express my support for the early release plan passed at the April meeting. 
the plan was passed with a five to do five to two vote, and you know it wasn't perfect. The discussion wasn't perfect, but it was a good decision. And you know, the vote was taken after a great show of support from the community. There was nobody in that room that said this is a bad idea. And so I'd like the board to stand behind their vote. Um, also, in the event that this is proposed today, I just wanted to throw in my two cents on shortening TDPE to make up for the last hour. Um, I've heard that that might be a compromise for the last hour of instructional times, maybe taking away some TDPE. And I don't know if it seems like a great idea, and I'd be interested in hearing what the teachers have to say about that. Um, but I think it's good to let the kids blow off a little steam during the day. Right, thank and you. I did do a little informal survey of the teachers, and they really don't want to give up TDP time. So, I mean, rather than nickel and diming the kids here and there throughout the day, I think that we could just stick with the plan as it was set in the beginning, one hour a week on Mondays for a year, renegotiate the contract after that, and let's just move forward. Let's move the conversation forward. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Uh, Paul Stack. Paul. Paul. Uh, Madam President, thank you. Can everyone hear okay? I'm having trouble hearing back there. Can you hear? Okay, there's a collection of documents that I had handed out before the meeting, and it's six pages, and I'd like just to just explain what they are. The first one shows Blythe Park Elementary School. It has a state ranking of one out of 600, 1,669 schools. And I saw some parents looking at that and thinking, wow. But I want to look at the top of it under the word Chicago in the center. Because that's the date that this was printed, August of 2000. The reason I had this, I had saved this, was because I was village president in 2000. And I use this document to help try and recruit businesses and either other people moving into Riverside to come here. It was a tremendous draw. The next page is the current ranking of Blake Park School. It's number 466 in the state of Illinois. Somehow, in 13 years, we've gone down 465 places. Now, the question might be, is this an anomaly? Was something just strange about this? So we go and we take a look at Hollywood. In 2000, Hollywood was number six in the state of Illinois. Today, Hollywood is, now it's right there, oh, 529. Ames has done better than most. Ames started out as 63rd, and it's now 99th. I didn't intend to become involved in the early release matter at all. My kids have graduated from Hauser, they've graduated from RB. But I live in the town, I'm a taxpayer, and I'm very interested in what happens to this town, what sort of people are attracted to this town, what sort of people stay in this town. And the importance of the public school system is far exceeds anything else. It exceeds the police department or fire department or anything else. When I saw the deterioration of the academic standards that have occurred in the last decade, I thought it was important that at least I come to the board and say, are you aware of this? We've had a very, very bad situation. Now, on the issue of the early release, I said I was opposed to it simply because we need every hour of classroom time we can get. Now, I did meet with Dr. Sharma and I did meet with Dr. Gannon as part of the parents. And there were some changes made, and I appreciate it. Dr. Gannon came up with a method by which we pick up an extra hour of task on time each week by reducing the teacher-directed phys ed. And uh, he's going to apply for a waiver to do that. That waiver, if granted, and we anticipate it will be, will be for five years. And I think the board should just make that automatically for the next five years. It should not be a one year only. Because there's a whole extra hour per week that's 32 hours of education that's being lost. Now, as we got into this issue, I was trying to figure out what happened. Why did we go down this much? The town hasn't changed. The kids are st still as smart as they always were. The buildings are the same. A lot of the teachers are the same. What is the explanation for this, this drop? And I think as we sort of 
teasing around the area, we have the shortest school year of any school in Cook County. There's a few others that are as short as us, but not many. We're at the statutory minimum, or maximum, I tell you. We have one of the shortest school days. And the problem we have right now is the short school year and the short school day are incorporated into the union contract. This board's hands are tied. You cannot extend it. When the parents talked to the teachers union and said, well, could you give us an extra 15 minutes a day for the four days that we don't have early release to make up for that hour, we got a big no. And it wasn't a, you know, please no. It was no, no way. We're not doing it. The union has dug in, and they're going to stay that way. The reason that's important because you have one year left of this contract, and you're going to start negotiating it sometime in the fall. And if you incorporate into the next three-year contract all of the shortcomings and all of the handcuffs you're operating under right now, you've guaranteed that for a four-year period, our school is going to be heading toward mediocrity. And we are in a downward arc. On the second page, where they have Blythe Park at uh, 466, on the far right side of it, it has the rank change from 2012. It has 16. Now, if you see this on the internet, in color, that's in red. It means we've gone down 16 places in the last year. Where we're going to be next year, I don't know, but I'm guessing we're going to be probably, Blythe Park will be somewhere in the 500s. We'll be out of the top third of the schools in Cook County, or the state of Illinois. So what I think, and looking and talking about this, I don't know exactly what happened. I, I, I'm totally mystified, and I think this board is mystified. And what I've recommended, and I'm going to recommend right now, is that this board, before they begin collective bargaining, bring in a consultant, a nationally known consultant, who comes here and say, what are we doing wrong? What is it we can do to change? Because whatever that consultant comes up with is going to have to be incorporated into the collective bargaining agreement. This is a very critical time for this school. If this board goes into the collective bargaining agreement unprepared, without knowing what it is it needs to know, we're going to be gone for another five years. So I want to thank you for the time. I want you to thank you for listening to me. But I do want to impress upon the parents and the teachers that there has got to be changes in the school system, and it's got to come in this room. It's got to come from the board. Now, much of the blame for this, I have to say, does not lie with people that are here. Dr. Sharma just got here. Dr. Gannon just got here. The person who was in charge of the school for that decade is no longer here. That's a good beginning. But I think now this board is going to have to step up to the plate and take control of the situation. So I just want to thank you for listening to me, and I want to thank the folks here for giving me a couple of minutes. Okay, thank bye. You very much, Paul. Uh, Elizabeth Coase, please. Thank you. <laughs> Hello, I'm Elizabeth Koss, and I have a second grader at Ames, um, and then I have another one that will enter Ames in a couple years. In the past, there's been quite a bit of controversy with both the board and the administration. This district was not happy with a school board that was seemingly dominated by our former superintendent and some of his questionable decisions. This superintendent and his team have been replaced by an entirely new administration and several new administrative positions. This new administration is comprised of well-respected members of the education community, and each were hired by the board because they felt that these individuals have strong curriculum backgrounds and therefore the skills to lead us through Common Core and beyond. In addition to the brand new administration, the majority of this district voted in three new school board members at our last election to help facilitate change. I have heard talk that some board members may feel they have a mandate to keep the administration in check. I have also heard talk that some members of the board have personal agendas that they are seeking to serve out in their current position. I would argue that your only mandate is to set district policy, approve educational goals, and authorize district expenditures for the betterment of each student that walks through our doors. I would further argue that your only agenda should be to provide each student a challenging education which promotes academic excellence, encourages creativity, develops critical thinking, and fosters respect for self, community, and environment. As many parents before me have pointed out, we are behind in our school rankings and, our, and student achievement scores are falling. This is not acceptable. We are now paying an unprecedented number of administrators to lead us in this new era. 
This district tends to be skeptical of our administrators, and I too am not in favor of giving them free reign over our students' futures. I expect our school board to challenge them, to ask questions, and to come to informed decisions. I also expect our administration to prove to parents that they are worth the larger amount of our tax dollars that are going towards their salaries. I expect to see innovation, collaboration, and climbing rankings. I expect the administration to come to these meetings each month with a detailed report of what you have accomplished and what your goals are for the next month. We have all heard that it doesn't matter who is right, it matters what's right. I have been frustrated and disappointed over the past few months about the arguing in these meetings and with attorneys to determine who was right about what. It is time to change the rhetoric to discussions about what is right for our districts and our students. The parents and taxpayers of this town cannot tolerate game playing and finger pointing and insist that challenges facing our children be the focus of these meetings. We have had a rocky recent past in this district, but that is in the past, and all of those people responsible for the discord are no longer a part of this district. I challenge all of you to look forward and to always hold a picture in your mind of children sitting in desks. Because while you answer to teachers, parents, and taxpayers, the most important people to whom you must answer is those students. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, Jerry. Jerry Buttermer. Hi, my name is Jerry Buttermer. I live on Scottswood Road. And like so many of us, my children went to this school district as well. And graduated somewhat recently, 07 and 05. So it's, it, was, it was right at the, at the cusp where things began to change. I was also very involved in helping new candidates get on this board, as I was with some at, at District 208, because we saw reform as necessary. We, we saw things slipping. We see a lot of good people, a lot of wonderful teachers, teachers that my, my kids had. Uh, but something else went wrong. So, something just got off the track a little bit. And I'm not sure exactly what it is. Uh, Mr. Stack said a lot of what I would applaud in terms of finding out those core reasons. Uh, I attended the meeting last week. And by background, I was heavily involved in professional training, uh, both as a recipient and as a provider and a creator of it. What I was puzzled with very much so at that meeting was it, it was great to see so much work going in and identifying time that could be used better, and I, and I applaud, the, applaud the administration for that. But I was puzzled because I couldn't see what it was we were going to teach these kids, that we were going to teach the teachers to teach the kids. And my understanding is there is no curriculum. There is no syllabus. So as an accountant by background, I'm sitting there thinking, wait a minute, if we don't know what it is that we're going to transfer to them, how do we know how long it's going to take? How do we know an hour is good enough? And I, and I think that the board should spend some very deliberate time on that issue. And even looking, we're, we're, ca we're a cash-rich district. Look and see what we can buy that's, that's solid, rock solid, that can get us back up to speed early. But I, I, I personally do not see uh, a sacrifice being made, and all of us need to make one to get this thing caught up. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, Mike Foley. <coughs> Thank you, Madam President. Uh, my name is Michael Foley. Live at 411 Selborne. Um, I come to you this evening not as some of you know a, a trustee in this village. I come to you as a parent the school district. I have two kids in this school district. Most of you have probably run across Thomas Foley in your life. He's a character. Um, he's a challenge, but he's the most important thing in my life. Uh, he loves all of you guys, and I know that at times he's been a challenge to you guys, but he means well, and he needs good education, and he's getting it right here at District 96. What I wanted to say, Paul kind of hit on, I don't have a problem with any person in this room. You're all wonderful, <coughs> talented, smart, brilliant teachers. You have taught my son, who is hard to teach, to be a good person, to care for people, to be smart, to do his homework, and keep his grades up. And you've done that without any of this extra training that we're talking about. 
Now I'm all about continuing education. I live in an environment where if I don't stay up on the latest construction standards, somebody's building's going to fall down. But I do that on my time, on my dime. I don't make it affect my clients. I don't make it affect the speed of the projects that I work in. I work in a very union-rich environment, all right, with crazier union laws than what we see here in the teachers' union. It's my choice to work with those unions or not, depending on where my projects fall within this area. In some areas, I'm mandated to use union labor. In some areas, I'm not. I have nothing against union labor. They're very skilled, but I don't believe in their work ethic. I don't believe in the ethic that the union says that you will stop work at this time when someone who's getting paid the same wage continues to work for three more hours. That's the union, not the person. They're just doing what the union tells them that they can do. I think it's important for us to give the teachers the education that they need to continue to teach kids like my son Thomas. But I don't think it should be done when we look at our clocks and say, it's 310 and I got to go. Or I can't spend any more time here. Or my kids aren't being taught at least the state minimum amount of days in the year. That's the union. And before we go into this next bargaining session, we have to understand that. I'm not coming here saying, I don't want you guys to be smarter, because then that's not going to make my children smarter. I want you to be as smart as you guys can be. But we all work hard. You guys work, I, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, six hours and 40 minutes a day or seven hours a day or... <laughs> Oh, is it, is it, no, well, no, 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 you're, you're in this building for that amount of time, right? You're, you're there longer? Okay, great, great. Then why, why can't we do this training as a lot of people I know do training on their own time, at their own expense? And the district's willing to pay you for your time. So I'm not talking to you as the teachers, I'm talking to the union and the mentality of the union that's what I want to speak to. And again, I'm talking as a parent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Um, Jane Archer, please. Uh. Hi, I'm Jane Archer. I live on Gage Road. Um, I, uh, I want to commend the administration for working towards getting Common Core implemented in our uh, district because it is the right direction. Um, it is, uh, puts us on the, the world stage, you know, gets our kids ready for that standard. And um, I know that the teachers want very much for the kids to succeed. And uh, sorry, I didn't put it all together beforehand. Um, the administration advised us that with the MAP test scores, that the, the scores of our children would drop with the changes in the test as they started to test the kids for the Common Core. And the problem I have with the early release and not making up for it in, a, in some other way is that um, if the kids are struggling already to, to be tested for a more rigorous curriculum, how is having less school time going to even if, it, even if the teachers are better trained, how is that going to help the children perform better on the tests? Um, I know that some parents will probably pick it up, pick up the, the extra you know, work at home with their children, but not everyone. And um, I have to, speaking to uh, what Mr. Foley said, my background is in healthcare and um, all of our professional development was on our own time and we had to pay for it ourselves. Um, I, I don't have a problem with the, the administration, you know, paying the teachers for that because if that's what it takes to get us, you know, to where we want to be, that's, that's a good start. But I, I really, I, I'm not understanding how the math works here for getting the, the kids um, to do well on the test scores. I just don't get it. Thank you very much, Jane. 
Um, and I want to thank everybody for their comments. Everybody, I think, has made good, respectful comments and um, given the board a lot to think about. Um, I um, also want to emphasize that people who are not in this room have a lot at stake. And um, and I want to thank Paul Stack for speaking. Uh, you know, for you know, for taxpayers who pay a lot of money for our schools and expect. Uh, and we all want to see the top performance that we've had in the past. And for me, that um, I know some people are, um, you know, wonder why this conversation is continuing, mainly so we can hear and focus on what the future is going to look like. I think a lot has has come out of it, and um, and I I do think, and you know, we really have to focus in on how we get back into those top 50. And uh, and I think instruction time and the length of our calendar um, are certainly things we have to look very, very closely at. And so I want to thank everybody for their comments and um, helping helping the board, uh, you know, focus on what lies ahead. Uh, and with that, I'm going to recognize a board member, uh, Art Perry, who would like to make a, a comment on a, another subject. Yeah, I'm going to change. <laughs> I'm going to change it up a little bit if that's okay. <laughs> Um, at last month's general business meeting, President Manja informed the board of a letter she received from RBHS District 208 Board President Matthew Cindy, addressing RB's proposed life safety and capital improvement projects, including plans for a new parking lot. I appreciate President Cindy's communication on these topics and District 208 reaching out to our superintendent to walk the proposed project. I also appreciate District 208 reaching out to community members and their plan to hold public meetings as the project progresses. President Cindy stated that student safety for both District 208 and District 96 will be their top priority. This is a must. Uh, President Cindy states that the zoo and Cook County Forest Preserve uh, will not allow a land swap or construction on their land. And I'm aware that many discussions have happened in the past uh, and I feel that District 208 should not give up so easily. District 208 and the community should approach the county board president if no progress is being made at lower levels. Alternatively, other remote parking options should be explored. The parking lot proposal is problematic because it will exacerbate the already serious traffic issues in the neighborhood, especially near Hollywood School. In addition to other factors, such as stormwater runoff, uh, other, those other factors will impact Hollywood School and neighboring homes and require serious study. Safety, optimal land use, and impact on the community must be the highest priority. I would like to request that District 96 Board of Education consider directing our administration to participate in the ongoing planning and discussions with District 208 on this project. I also urge my fellow board members to pay very close attention to this project as it progresses. Thank you, President. All right. Thank you, Art. And um, I'd like to take up your recommendation in new business today. Okay. Um, and Randy, would you also like to speak on the parking lot at this time, or would you like to wait until uh, new business discussion? New business. I, I would echo uh, Art's uh, concern, and it is close, very close to my concern. Okay. Thank All right. You. All right, thank you. Um, uh, Bob, no. Um, you want to talk to us a little bit about the FOIA request uh, this month? Sure. We received two FOIA requests, one from uh, Mr. Skolnick for a copy of any letters sent by Mrs. Gill and or Mr. Howes to any members of the District 96 Board of Education, and the response is included in your packet. Um, we also received another FOIA request from uh, Tovar Snow Professional Services for any bids that District 96 has put out in public for snow plows or snow removal services. And that response is also included in your packet. Uh, all right, thank you. Um, Bethna, how long do you, will the instructional time committee take <coughs> your presentation? My portion is probably about 10 minutes, but I don't know if any of the other parents are speaking. Um, they are. Okay, so I don't know how long that All right. What I would like to do, um, if uh, somebody uh, would move, uh, I would like for presentations, I would like to ask the uh, instructional time committee uh, to speak first. Do, do we need to move uh, 
move that ahead of the financial planning five year projection, please. I have a motion. It's uh, not very audible back here. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Uh, all I'm, I'm asking the board if somebody um, would move uh, just to change the order of our agenda to move the instructional time committee update before our financial planning five year projection. I move. I'm fine with that. Second. Okay. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Any opposed? All right. Um, okay. Uh, Martha, would you like to go first? Sure. Um, We're going to have to just take a minute to switch computers. So the board president at that time asked for a committee of parents and teachers um, for the administration to get together and see if they can come up with some type of a compromise um, to review and look up how to make up that hour um, that we would be losing for early release um, going for next year. Um, I, before we get started, I wanted to just give everybody an overview. <coughs> I know there's been some comments and some questions and some information out there that may not always be accurate. So I just want to take a second to just uh, clarify that. Sorry, Bob. No, you should probably grab the microphone. The microphone. Thank you. We got strongly no I know, but they, we got scolded for not. Yes, and thank you for thank you for letting her know because I've been I've had emails on the subject and uh, and also uh, our nice crew reminded me. But so. now I can't walk. I know. Oh. Now you're taped to the panel. Okay. I know. I know, right? Wait, what about Headpiece? this one? I think use this one. I think that one um, removes as well. Is that one taped also? Okay. You can untape it. Yeah, a little more room to dance around. Better watch that. Just need to stand still. I can't do that. That's the problem. Okay, so the one, the early release plan that was approved at the April fifteenth board meeting is for one year. It was a one-year early release professional development plan. Um, as we all know, and I think we all agreed to, and it was definitely verified at the instructional committee um, meetings, is that professional development is very much needed. It has been lacking, and it's been done inconsistently in the past. So what we're looking for going forward is a consistent and continuous plan to get everybody caught up and everybody to get the same information on our staff. Um, and then we would reevaluate, looking ahead for next year, and determine how much and when would be needed once we got everybody caught up with Common Core, with Para, with Least Restrictive Environment, um, as well as 21st Century Skills. Those were the four, two th four topics that we were looking at. And then that's when REC and the Board of Education were going to continue those conversations during negotiations. We are not eliminating advisory for next year, and we are not eliminating Quest for next year. I know that those are some of the questions and concerns that have been out there. In addition, there are some questions about what information was available from other districts. As I shared at the last board meeting, there is a stack of about 20 um, copies for any of you that are interested in any of the surveys, excuse me, any of the districts that were surveyed. And it wasn't for early release. It was for professional development what other districts are doing for professional development. All of those results are listed out there for you. 
So the meeting, um, excuse me, so uh, the meeting outcomes. When the instructional committee met, we had two members um, from our board, Mr. Gadama and Ms. Manja, eight parents, um, three REC members, and then two administrators, Dr. Gannon and myself. And the question was, how do we recapture those 60 minutes um, of instructional time that has been lost for early release due to professional development? We met again on the 11th. Um, and there was a smaller number of parents, staff, and administrators to look at specifically the schedule at the elementary and the middle school and how to, and how to capture that. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Gannon, and hopefully this will address some of uh, Mr. Buttermer's questions of what are we going to use that time for? What are the agenda? What are the topics? How is that time going to be structured? What are staff going to be doing at that time? So he's done um, a brief outline, and I'd like to call him up here, and you have to stand right there. Really hard for me. <laughs> I need an X, otherwise I'm all over the place. Um, I, I apologize that it's so small up there. Um, so what this is, this is a professional development monthly design. Um, we do have two brand new curriculums. From kindergarten through eighth grade, they are brand new in math and ELA. Um, and they are just about complete, um, so we appreciate that. But that training is only, like, so only, the only teachers that have been part of that training are the people that have been on the committee. So that in and of itself is, um, there's a lot of professional development. Um, that we need there. So you'll see common core alignment quite a bit throughout this plan. Uh, the first Monday of the month, um, who is it for? It's for all certified staff and paraprofessionals. We are super excited um, to um, have a, an opportunity to include um, our paraprofessionals as well as our teachers with all of our PD. So that's um, very exciting. Um, where um, in each building with building staff, you'll see, um, if I'm just going to jump down to the bottom, um, you'll see the times. Um, the first three Mondays are an hour. So we're not traveling, because by the time you get there, um, it's, it's, it's really difficult to get a lot done. So within those times, um, in the first Monday of the month, you'll see Common Core Standards alignments. These days will be planned at the district level with principals and with staff, um, so they'll be consistent across the board. Um, we, um, on the first Monday, we'll focus on um, Professional Evaluation Reform Act, PARA. We've been working um, wonderfully together to um, look at the new evaluation framework, state mandate. So we're excited about, uh, I'll share a little bit more later on today about how far we've gotten in that process. And we're going to focus on least restrictive environment and inclusive practices. So the first Monday of each month we have, that is our strategic focus. Um, the second Monday of each month, again, we have everybody with us. It'll be at their own, everybody's own building. We're going to focus on RTI. Um, and it's hard to separate some of these because Common Core and RTI are connected. Uh, but we, we need to make a concerted effort to make sure that we're focusing on these. Um, also, student assessment and growth, data analysis, and instructional planning. Um, to go back to the, um, the comment about the, the map tests, we, we really need to look at how our kids are performing on the Common Core Online map test, and we need to make some changes. Um, and we are going to use that data as well as other data to help us focus on making those changes. 21st century teaching and learning, um, and English language learner support, instructional strategies, and programs. So we have a long list of things we need to do. Um, what we needed to do was kind of organize how we're going to do it. And what are we going to cover when? Um, so those are the first two Mondays. <coughs> the third Monday can look a little bit deceiving, so I want to be honest. There's actually only a couple of those days um, because we're off that many Mondays. So I wrote third Monday of the month if there are four Mondays in the month. And I think there's only two. So I just want to be honest with that. <laughs> uh, each building, again, with their staff. Um, this is our opportunities um, to really focus on common core vertical articulation and curriculum instructional alignment. And what that means is that um, we'll be doing this at other times as well, but that means that our grade level teachers are going to be able to have professional development with other grade levels. So depending on where our focus is at for the Common Core, uh, teachers might meet in kindergarten and first grade teams might meet together. It's vertical alignment, uh, making sure that our curriculum um, it continues to be more challenging at each level, as well as how are we providing supports and resources for those students that are at a higher level in kindergarten? What's first grade doing? How do we move all students forward? They might meet K through K through two, um, and there's a whole bunch of different combinations: um, one, two, two, three, three, four, four, five, um, seven, eight, um, five, six will be important as well. Very important, um, not just at that transition time, but throughout the school year. Um, to make sure because we haven't had opportunities really to vertically align fifth grade with the junior high. Um, so those are um, vertical alignment days. And then the last Monday of each month, um, again, everybody's with us. These will be at the Hauser Central Campus. And in the um, collective bargaining agreement, um, there are 15 um, meetings that we, can, um, that we can have that are um, 
extend the day by 45 minutes. Um, we're going to use nine of those meetings in this PD plan. So you'll see that the last um, Monday of the month is longer. And the reason we did the last one is because there's always a last Monday of the month, right? There's always a first Monday. There's usually a second, right? There's always a last. So, um, so, so this will be monthly no matter what because there's got to be a last Monday. Um, and that'll be at, uh, again, the Hauser and Central Campus. Um, grade level, um, special areas, related services, articulation, focusing on common core implementation, RTI, and data analysis. This is times when we are going to be able to look at um, student trajectories, like throughout the year, like where a student was in, kinder, in, like in first grade. Um, they'll be able to look at um, data and um, the amount of growth the student is making and how do we need to realign and change instruction. Um, so we'll be looking at this with an individual student lens as well as with a, um, an, an overall um, lens. Um, this is going to have a big focus on as well Common Core, RTI, um, and really a big piece of this is going to be that data analysis. Um, and our specialist teachers will be able to, um, we've provided some training on, on Common Core um, in the content areas. So our special teachers will be able to focus on, on Common Core and how they can support the Common Core within their specialty areas as well. So um, that's the time when you see all the music teachers together, all the PE teachers together, um, all the ELA teachers together, English language arts, math teachers, and so on, so we can talk about that specific instruction. So Brian, if I could just think about how this works. For some of the things that are built, for the meetings that are building specific, and it's Common Core Standards Alignment, the members of CCAT and 21T Cubed and those who have already been working through all of this Common Core prep this year are going to be leading some of that work in those buildings, right? Is that and I, like yes. one thing that would happen? That's yes, absolutely. And yes, and um, we have a little presentation later on that hopefully will explain this a little bit more, but that's exactly it. You know, um, we, we're using a train-the-trainer model. We, we trained a lot this year with our Common Core um, teams and they've already started working with their grade level teams. Um, but yeah, so the, a big part of um, implementing this is a train the trainer model. Um, they've done a phenomenal job, and that is really going to be the most effective way to get it uh, uh, get the training in a timely manner. Because I and, and I said this before, but um, I'm very serious when I say that I am um, instructional time is very important to me, and I do look at this as a one year. Um, and within that um, belief, it's we need to get the training as effective as quickly as, as, as possible for all of our teachers. And the best way to do that is to train the trainer model. All right. And I had one other can, question. Can, yeah. can we, would the board be able to see some like status or recap of some of this work, um, maybe on a monthly board meeting basis or ed committee or whatever? Absolutely. Okay. And, absolutely. We, we also plan on having um, you know, evenings for parents as well, and um, including the parents on our, on our journey together as well. So. Um, that'll be all part of, um, I don't know if that'll happen monthly, but we, we will have those for sure. Okay. Brian, with, with, uh, this, oh, with this train the trainer model, um, um, who, who specifically is in charge of the class? So depending on the setup, um, I mean, I, I would put myself as a person that's responsible for, um, in the, for the main part for, for the planning and the um, implementation. Um, but then we have our CCAT members um, we have, the way that we, we organize it is um, we have about a third of our staff that have been trained on either ELA or math. Mm -hmm. um, and they designed a curriculum based on the standards, so they know the standards inside and out. So they will be um, the trainers, and that will depend on, um, like, exactly who's in the class will depend on what area we're focusing on. Um, if it's grade level, then it will be the grade level peers. Um, principals are going to have a, a big role in planning and also um, the supervision and implementation as well. All right. Is there any way to see the content of what, let's say, the first hour looks like of a class? Uh, uh, sure, absolutely. Um, what? So we've right now we're in the process of actually breaking down. I mean, it, depending on how things turn out um, over the summer, we're going to break down each uh, okay. what each PD will look like, and and, and we, we want to be very transparent about that as well. Um, so yeah, I mean, we would. Uh, I, I would definitely recommend that we are we, we share what we're doing. All right. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. And I don't mean to put it's you on the spot. No, 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 no. I think that's an important question, and, and, and I think it's extremely important for us to do that. Brian, are you saying that uh, that's available? Is that something available through Sync Solutions? That here's what we're talking about. This is what's going to be taught during in each one of the modules, and you know, I you know I would recommend if you want to see it in action, 
Yeah. You should you should go visit and do a classroom visit. Um, and that, that's I, what I, Lisa and I did. Yeah, I so. think I think that's great, but I still want our administrators to present their plan to us in a public meeting. I think that's important. Um, and and by seeing what's there, that will you know make sure that what they're I, I, again make a link between what what uh, <clears throat> what our administrators are telling us and and help us to visualize it better. Sure. Well, I agree. I mean, even if we do what you suggest, we can't be in every building. No, but you can experience right. it. Sure. Cool. Yeah. I think that's that's just as valuable as just hearing it. I mean, if if the public is sitting there saying, board members, is this the right path? Is this you know? What better way than just being there, right there, seeing how it's being implemented? Because otherwise, it's just words on a piece of paper. Well, again, I think it's important for our administrators to tell us in a public meeting and explain to us what it look, what 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 the plan is. Um, uh, also, I have a question: When will Common Core actually this Common Core curriculum actually be taught in a classroom? When is your target date? August of next year. Um, we are we're, we're starting. I mean, as you know, we, we did the pilot um, already, and the kids responded extremely well to it. Um, we right now um, will have the first three units for uh, for next school year will be uh, completely done. Um, over when you say summer. August of next year, we're talking August 2015. Yeah, we're ready. 14. 14. 2014. 2014. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we're we're talking. Wait, this too quick. Just failed yeah. the calendar <laughs> test. Get with the program. Sorry. So we are talking. That you will be you teaching Common Core this coming August when school opens, yeah. uh, and, and without any professional development occurring in the summer. So, can oh, you help me understand of, that? We have a lot of PD going on over the summer. Um, I was at Ames today for summer school, and there were three or four teams meeting there. Uh, but we have a lot of teachers coming in over the summer. There's also days in August. Right? Yes, and those days in August, um, days. you know, Sing Solution. But again, this is why it's units one and three. Um, okay. We, we have a lot more than that work done. We, we pretty much have all the units done, but units one and three are our focus um, early on in this, you know, at late summer and early school year so we can really um, make a smooth transition and have teachers confident and comfortable. And I know that, like, a lot of these CCAP members are already meeting with their teams that, that, ha that weren't a part of the committee, so and we'll be ready. So and so that's units yeah. one and three for each grade level, yes. for grades K through eight. In ELA and math. ELA and math. Mm -hmm. um, and, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, shift gears a little bit. Um, you, you laid out first Monday, second, third, and fourth. Uh, do you have a do you have a, a, a number total of each? I do, but I didn't put it on there. Of, wow. of the first Mondays and how it compares with the second and third and fourth. I do. Um, I'm happy to send that. Um, I I actually took it off of there. Um, but yes, I, I have the exact dates that we'll, that we'll be covering. I ask that because with holidays yeah. and so forth, um, I did note that the first uh, Monday of the month, para, the para training, is going to be focus, a focus? Yes, and, one of them. And can you uh, go over that, uh, what, what para is again? Sure. Sure. Um, and, and again, just to reiterate, if there if the first Monday there's no school, then that first Monday goes to the next the first Monday. It's the first school Monday. school Monday. First just, school yeah. Monday. Yeah. So you don't you, you wouldn't skip no no skip no that. no the leeway is in the third third week. That's kind of where we will make up. Okay. Um, it's yeah. So um, so the, the para is um, the Performance Evaluation Reform Act, and that is um, the state of Illinois' um, new mandated um, teacher evaluation. Um, system so we get to work with the REC to to create what that what framework will look like um, so we're very much um, in the works of doing that um, that is the um, framework that um, in a couple years will we require uh, student growth components within the evaluation process okay. as well so all right I, you've answered the question uh, so the first Monday would be the para teacher evaluation would be a big focus there common core is going to be the third Monday. Uh, no, it's actually um, and some of the first Mondays is Common Core. Common Core and Para, um, we will be able to connect together. Um, I'm sorry, but I I can't yes, read. Yeah, I can't read. It. It's it's uh, too small. <laughs> but I'm just trying to to make sure that we're putting the focus on the Common yeah. Core early in the month, yeah. early in the school year, 
And um, when I hear that teacher evaluation is first thing out of the block, out of the starting gate on the first Monday, I that's it, it raises a red wrong. flag. That's, that's, not, that's, what it's that's saying. not what it's saying. Um, that's not what it's saying. Sorry. The, well, let, sorry. Yeah. The first Monday, okay, so um, for example, the first Mondays of the month, we're actually going to be focusing on Common Core. But what that goes is as we rotate, you know, in, in every month, you know, there's that first Monday throughout the school year, we're going to focus on one of these topics. Now, the first couple Mondays, if you see Common Core alignment is, well, you can't see it, but it's first on there. <laughs> uh, sorry. Um, and I apologize for that. Um, that's what we're going to be focusing on first. Once we get to a place when we're ready to, to start connecting Common Core and Para, we'll start doing that as well. Um, so it just means that that'll happen on a first Monday of the month. This sure. helps make sure we cover our, our topics. Okay. I, I guess I'm, uh, I share your concern, President uh, Manja, about uh, Common Core. When are we going to fully implement uh, Common Core instruction? And, and I say that in light of the fact that people, uh, and uh, teachers and public and, and many people comment that we're three years behind. Yeah. So in light of the fact that we're three years behind, uh, should we be playing half court defense, picking up the a, a sports terminology? Yeah. Should we be picking them up at half court or should we be using full court pressure? And would a full court pressure, wouldn't that focus more of the common core training early in the school year or in the summertime? Yeah, and, and it, I, that is part of the design. Part of the design is early in the school year um, and throughout the summer we're focusing on common core. Um, I do have to just um, state that a lot of these are state mandates as well. We have to do these things. Para, we can't say we're not going to do para this year. Um, we, we will be out of compliance. I mean, these are things that weren't these are things that need to be done. But we're out of compliance on Common Core for three years. We are, but and we've we've made a ton of progress this year, and we're going to continue that. But we, we Wait, can't. Are, are we out of compliance right now? No. Isn't yeah, the implementation no, we're 2016? By the test. For, when, for Yeah, for, um, no, for Common Core. When do we have to absolutely be aligned with Common Core? Is there a drop dead? Uh, so originally it was this past school year. Um, I know that there's a lot of school districts that are well, not a lot but there are some that aren't there yet I don't know if there's a compliance issue in common core yeah. um, but I mean isn't the, the assessment the compliance I mean, when the assessment comes spring. out that's next spring there will be right. full assessment our assessments will be fully aligned to common core this year there were 25 percent of them 25 percent of the questions were aligned to common core right but I, I I'm not yes um, so our students then are going to be faced as we did with the map testing this year they're going to be faced with common core assessments so our, the, our decision is you, know, you don't yeah it, we don't it, want to wait you know I mean so we've we've moved a lot this year with Common Core we have a lot more to go um, but to answer the question too as far as um excuse me um, <clears throat> what uh, if if we should really be um, more aggressive more aggressive and and working through Common Core only um, we've have these other mandates um, and in other important areas of instruction that that we we need to focus on and our our job then is to connect those to common core so it is all connected and all fluid um, but we can't just ignore them um, Brian I, I know that pure is state mandated and uh, but we're not going to be able to implement it until uh, until January 2016 because of the collective bargaining agreement in other words a collective bargaining agreement doesn't provide for it so therefore it won't be taking effect until the new agreement um, so, um, so, uh, is there any flexibility there in t training in in Pira uh, because of when we when we can be on board with implementing it? Uh, there isn't a sense that I will say as to when we choose to go down that route for Pira next year with our PD. Like we don't have to do it day one, day two, but we do have a lot of staff out there that are extremely. Um, eager to find out what we're doing with Paris, so we want to make sure that we're providing that feedback as well. And we also need time to pilot the, the evaluation tool. Um, we need time to to try to see if it's effective because that evaluation tool is first and foremost about effective instruction. And we can't go into a year and say, "Hey, okay, 
we're gonna, you know, go ahead, this is our new evaluation tool. We have teachers that have volunteered to say, hey, pilot me, you know, let's, let, let's see if this works. Um, we need that opportunity because, again, it should be a tool that really enhances instruction, instructional practices. Also, I mean, to re sort of go back to what Mr. Stack was saying earlier, we have to be prepared for the negotiations for the CBA. If we can have that, a good handle on what that para process looks like and consensus among the board administration and the REC and the teachers will be in you know much better prepared I think for those negotiations so that's something to think about yeah, yeah and I do just want to stress like the umbrella of all of this is, is, is common core like I said we 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 will be able to connect everything we're doing with with common core all right um. you know I would just say that you know the past is the past but it seems as if we we haven't been aggressive enough in this school year in the 2013 24 you say we've accomplished a lot mm -hmm. I feel as if we haven't accomplished enough that's my personal opinion and with that impatience I want to push this along faster and um, so that is that is my viewpoint going forward and I would like and I expressed this opinion early in the 2013 fall and um, um, I would I think it's uh, you know high time that we 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 catch up with a common core and we do what's needed to catch up all right um, and that work all right um, Ryan, okay. I'm going to come talk about the proposal. Um, yep, next slide. Yes. And one way to do that, Mr. Brockway, is to make sure that everybody's trained um, and getting the equal opportunity. And the way that we can do that and why we weren't able to do to be as aggressive this year is there was no structure in place to train our teachers. So that's why we had to pull people for committees and get substitutes. So going forward, um, sorry, <laughs> the elementary schedule. Um, what we've done is look at TDPE, and I know Mrs. Evans talked about it um, and commented that teachers weren't very happy about <coughs> adjusting or modifying TDPE, and I completely understand that. And we talked to principals who spoke with their building leadership teams, and they are willing to make that compromise and adjust their schedule for TDPE, which currently right now is at 30 minutes, three times a week, for a total of 90 minutes a week. And TDPE is teacher-directed physical education. So when they don't have PE with a certified PE teacher, the teacher um, provides that teacher-directed PE for them in the classroom. What we found in our very early studies of talking to principals and talking to teachers is it's inconsistent district-wide. So not every first grade is doing the exact same activities. They're not doing them at the exact same time. Um, they may not be meeting student needs. It's based on when gym space is available. It's based on when playground space is available. So some classes are going out for TDPE at 8.30 in the morning, or some classes are going out, you know, a half an hour right before lunch. That may not be when students need an actual movement break or a brain break. Um, and also, it's unstructured. So in the sense of different schools, different grade levels are doing it in different ways. So there is a lack of accountability and fidelity in the quality of the programming and the activities that are being done. So what this committee is proposing is that we restructure TDPE time to three sessions at 10 minutes each um, and taking that down to 30 minutes a week. We would make it consistent district wide so each grade level will be doing the exact same things. There would be a flexible schedule based on when kids need those breaks and teachers can put those into their um, schedule as needed. Um, and then there would be structured activities to be, de de ugh, excuse me, to be developed in partnership with our district occupational and physical therapists. So what we're also saying is then to maintain our lunch recess, which we have right now, um, on average it's 25 minutes every day, five days a week, which is 125 minutes a week. Maintain our current PE classes with our certified PE teachers, which is 30 minutes, two days a week, for a total of 60 minutes. So that 125 minutes of recess, plus the 30 minutes of TDPE that we're looking to restructure, plus the 60 minutes of maintaining our current PE schedule will give us a, approximate 250 minutes a week of physical activity. If we divide that by five days a week, that's an average of 43 minutes a day. And that's what is equivalent to our Hauser students who are getting 42 minutes a day. 
So this would be for the K-5 schedule. So we've recaptured our 60 minutes by taking our 90 minutes of TDPE, taking that down to 30 minutes a week, giving us 60 minutes of, of instruction gained. And as we heard earlier, there is an option to do a TDPE waiver that's done by the state for students, excuse me, for schools that don't have um, the facilities to do TDPE or need to regain that time in academics. It can be a waiver that's done annually or something for five years. It is done online and has a very short turnaround time. So um, we're planning on applying for that um, for the elementary schedule. And just so that everybody can see what an actual elementary schedule looks like currently with our TDPE and then proposed with a modified schedule, I've asked Mr. Gatz to come in um, and speak to that for us since he is an elementary, since the principal of uh, Central and can give us the elementary schedule perspective. Thank you. The schedule that's up on the screen right now is on the, based on the current TDPE schedule, that 90 minutes three times a week on the days that uh, those three 30 minute sessions on the days that students don't have PE during the school week. So this is a typical primary classroom. You can see there's emphasis on, <clears throat> excuse me, on word study, writing, language arts, math, all those pieces. You can see this is a day when students in this classroom would have music. Um, the SEL standards are, are being uh, instru receiving instruction on those days. And you can see that TDP, TDPE fit in in this classroom um, for 30 minutes right before the end of the school day. That's just when it was able to fit. Um, as you look at this, the goal, as always, is to maintain consistency of instruction and not interrupt activities throughout the school day. A single 30-minute block of time is very difficult for staff members and teachers to fit in to isolated spots based on where gym availability might be or recess or, in my case, at Central, teachers working around Hauser's schedule where they might be outside for PE. So the space within the building on the campuses um, limits those pieces. And looking at the model that we're proposing and taking that, um, I don't know if you have the next slide, looking at those pieces, and instead of taking that solid 30 minute block of time, taking it looking on this specific day, two five minute brain break or movement breaks. And what you also notice is by taking that solid 30 minutes out, this class is also able to fit science in on that day. Because what happens when you talk with teachers and they look at instruction, because teachers are evaluated, and they're not evaluated, but we look at student growth over the course of the year, based on math and language arts. So those things through map testing or through ISATs where students, we can actually see quantifiable data to see how students are performing. The last place they're gonna give up instructional minutes is math and language arts, because those are the two places that they can see. So by going to this model and it, the teacher will be able to slot five minutes where it fits logically to them within their classroom during the course of the school day, they're able to recapture instructional minutes um, within the school day for those students. And then I'm going to invite Mrs. Gill to come up to speak to the Hauser schedule. So in the, for the recapturing of minutes for science in this example, what does that amount to? What is the difference from what they might be doing now with science? Well, if you look during, over the course of the school week, if you're looking at three 30-minute three slots, chances are there, it, it could rotate based on how the teacher sets up their schedule. Science or social studies could be lost one or two times a week to TDPE. Okay. Okay, I'm addressing the Hauser schedule. So a normal class day is 40, a class period is 40 minutes. And with a revised schedule, by getting out at 2.15 and starting at 8.35, each class minute would be 37 minutes, uh, except for our lunch classes would be down to 36 minutes. We are taking out advisory. Advisory is technically a non-instructional class, except for music. I do have to put that plug in. Um, our seventh and... Okay, advisory is out just on Mondays. This is the Monday schedule, the Monday schedule. So maybe we should go to the next slide. Okay, so the way we're going to recapture our minutes is that uh, we have announcements first and ninth periods, which can estimate at three minutes, so that's six minutes a day, times the four days would be 24 minutes, four days meaning Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. We're, our plan is to read those announcements in advisory, on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. So that recaptures the 24 minutes. And then the 30 minutes on Monday where we did not have advisory, which is the non-instructional time, that plus the 24 minutes is 54 minutes regained. And 
um, on Monday, when we do not have our advisory, um, we will be adjusting our music groups for the remaining four advisories, and will be larger um, music lessons taught during that advisory half hour. We do have flexibility within that music schedule that, that we can do that. So larger means more kids or just what are yeah, the, more, what kids. more kids? Yeah, we have about 170 students in the 7th and 8th grade band orchestra and chamber orchestra program. So um, divided now instead of by five, it'll be by four. Can I throw in a pitch for looking at the Hauser schedule specials or you know encore to see if music can go there for seventh eighth grade? I know it's a whole separate subject. I well, don't want to get off track, but we would love it. <laughs> All right, Sorry. that is a whole other topic, though. We would love it. <laughs> I know. Okay. So with with the recaptured minutes in both elementary and at Hauser. Are we essentially where we're at this year? We're uh, in instructional time. <coughs> Brian, can I ask you that question? Yeah, we're, uh, we're not. We're not gaining or losing any minutes from the 2013-2014 school year. So, uh, I'm not always trying to understand your question, but yeah, we, so on Mondays, we have a normal schedule. Well, I'm, I'm talking about uh, total uh, school, uh, what is it? Instructional school minutes? School day, school year, um, instructional minutes, yes. For the right, so um, this, by eliminating advisors in junior high, uh, so it really replaces an hour. Um, so by eliminating advisors on Mondays, um, where at about half hour or less of, um, of instructional time um, through that. Um, so um, some of the classrooms will be cut short um, by a couple of minutes to make up that time. So uh, we'll we just flip to the next slide, maybe your question. Okay. Can you go back to the previous slide? <laughs> this one? <coughs> 37 to 40 minutes. Yeah. It's hard to see. So each class is shortened about three minutes um, on Mondays only. On Mondays only. To accommodate for that early release. Yeah. I guess I'm 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 looking at not the minutes but the big bigger picture. You know, we're are we are we uh, we're not gaining any ground. Are we losing ground yet? With instructional time? Yes. We will have a little bit less and we'll have less instructional time on Mondays. Why don't you flip to the So the that would then relate to the, the rest of the week as well. For the whole. Um, that time is not made up. That time is not made up. Yes. Okay. All right. Oh, I'm going backwards. Sorry. So um, to summarize, our work not only as an all district leadership team for the uh, first six months from January through, excuse me, from December through May. Again, this is a one year plan. We're looking to get um, caught up to get everybody consistent professional development, but we've reorganized the day at the elementary to recapture all 60 minutes um, for elementary schools with the one hour of early release. We've reorganized the Hauser uh, schedule to recapture 54 of the 60 minutes at the middle school. We feel again that all staff could get caught up to provide that rigorous and relevant instruction on those Mondays for early release and that's everybody not just the committees that are working right now on Common Core not just the committees that are working on para it's going to be everybody getting that consistent training and it's going to have immediate impact on our kids so when you get trained on Monday those teachers are going to be able to go back into their classroom on Tuesday and teach and implement those lessons or skills that they were learned and be able to collaborate with their, their colleagues a week later and say this worked, this didn't work, I saw growth, I didn't see growth, let's, re let's review this, let's make it better, let's you know take this out. But it's that continuous and constant um, collaboration and information that they're going to be getting that we don't have right now. And again, providing that professional development is going to maximize student learning by, instruction, by strengthening the instructional quality. So that's our... Uh, review of not only our work with the compromise committee but then a recapturing of everything that we've done for the first six months all right um, thank you um, and thank you Brian for clarifying when we're actually when we are going to be teaching common core in the class I have not heard that before thank you
I left the microphone right on that. Okay, thank you. I am Karen Foley. I'm a pediatrician and I've been involved in the instructional committee. I um, want to start off by saying I did not get the feeling that there was a lot of community involvement in this decision. I have the feeling that this came about very quickly. I think some of the PTO members might have uh, felt that they were aware, but I know the survey came to parents asking if they needed after child care or not. There wasn't a lot of buy-in from the community and I think that's a problem. So I'm gonna start that off with that. Secondly, our instructional time committee did meet. First time, we didn't come to much agreement. Second time, the administration and the teachers uh, agreed to this sort of patch work, how to recapture that time. Our group is not satisfied with that option. We have two other options. And I'll get into why, why we, um, are not satisfied with that. Of course, yeah. Of course. And we'll host it. Mm -hmm. Um, why this is coming up. I, I think I think our group did come to several agreements. One was we definitely want teachers to get professional development. We're all in agreement with that. We think the teachers deserve it. We want them to get it. The other thing is we want to minimize instructional loss time for our kids. Everybody was in agreement to that. So how this is accomplished is where there was some disagreement. Uh, all right. I have, an, I have this flash drive here if you want to try it, or I have another flash drive. I use a different computer? Do you have a new? Difficulty. <laughs> you know what? While while we're waiting, uh, Bhavna has some announcements she would like to read. Um, sure. Would you like to do that? <laughs> Let's use the time here. It's part of our agenda. It's item D. What we've started doing is just highlighting some of our student and staff announcements that uh, principals and community members have shared with us. So first of all, I'd like to congratulate um, 200 students who successfully graduated from Hauser on June 11th. 
um, our presidential award, we had 165 students earn academic excellence and or educational achievement award, and the full list is available on our website. But at Ames, we had 16 fifth grade students. At Blythe Park, we had 12 fifth grade students. At Central, we had 29 students. At Hollywood, we had five students. And at Hauser, we had 103 students. Other noteworthy news, um, our Young Authors Program, we had three students uh, represent District 96 at the 40th Annual Young Authors Conference at, the, at Illinois State in Bloomington in May. And also this year, our District 96 manuscripts were displayed at the local library. And I want to thank Mrs. Bryan for leading that um, organization and also that involvement. Um, also, Ames Student Council donated $1,000 of the money that they raised during the 13-14 school year. $333 were donated to PAWS, $333 were donated to Rush Hospital, and $333 were donated to Beds Plus. Hauser students raised $2,500 um, during the 1314 Make a Wish Foundation. Congratulations to Mr. Bill House, who was recognized by the Central PTO as Teacher of the Year. And we wish our 1314 retirees, Mrs. Gail Golitz, <coughs> Mr. Harry Cannery, Mr. Tom McCluskey, Ms. Christine Munoz and Ms. Judy Straka um, well in their next career of retirement. So those are our announcements from District 96. Is that a good pause? Did you? More announcements. You want to vote on the minutes? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> all right. Uh, uh, may as well conduct a little business here. Um, excuse me. It's okay. May I have a, uh, a motion to um, approve the minutes of the closed session meeting, April 15, 2014, the minutes of the special meeting, April 26, 2014, the minutes of the closed session of April 26, the minutes of the finance committee meeting, May 6, the minutes of the special meeting, May 6, uh, also the closed session minutes of May 6, uh, the regular business meeting minutes of May 20th, and the minutes of the closed session of May 20th. May I have a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Uh, Juanita, if you could call the roll. Lisa Gaynor? Aye. Arthur Perry? Aye. Randy Brockway? Aye. David Kodama? Aye. Mary Rose Mangia? Aye. Thank you. Just take a pick them off. We'll wind up repeating things. Yeah. Well, that or we can go right down the new business. And, no. All right. You know what? What we can do is a uh, the suggestion is uh, that we do brief uh, board committee updates um, while we're waiting. Uh, would you like to uh, start, um, David? Okay. Uh, the policy committee. Uh, met be prior to this uh, to this regular business meeting. Um, at the at that meeting, we uh, went through six uh, policies uh, policy updates that uh, we conducted a second reading, and we will be taking those um, those policies up and forwarding them to advancing them to the regular business meeting of July fifteenth for final action. So those policies are uh, posted on our website for anyone's review and final comment. Uh, we, we then uh, looked at two policies uh, that were brought to us uh, by our, our staff and, and uh, board on policy 460 on purchases and contracts and the superintendent spending limit, um, and then policy 730 with regards to student assignment and interest district transfer. So we just made some um, some minor uh, minor amendments to those policies, and uh, the policy 460 is it was uh, approved for a first reading, so we'll have a second reading at the next policy committee meeting. And policy 730 was approved for a second reading, and that will be moved to the uh, July 15th regular business meeting for final action. Thank you. 
uh, the committee uh, voted in support of uh, proceeding forward um, with a, a vote of three to one uh, that the superintendent should uh, enter into a an agreement with the ISB for administrative procedures uh, services and this is where the ISB would come in do an audit of our procedures see uh, look at our policies see what procedures are, are lacking and and give us a report on uh, on uh, potential procedures that we can we could implement and so this was an, this is just an overall effort to create a procedural manual man, a manual for the district for that would be used by all all five, all our uh, school buildings to ensure that all our policies are being implemented accurately and consistently. Consistently. Uh, yes. David, just on a, on a note, that note that we're going forward, can we agree what sort of updates the board would like on the progress of this? Um, kind of kind yes. of going back that it fulfills an objective. If sure. it, if, if if the criteria, if all you need to fulfill it is to have the guys come in and do the audit. Yeah. You know, I'd like to like get some. Uh, some, I guess some. I, no, I totally agree. That we need, we, we want, we want uh, updates as it proceeds forward. Um, and the analysis of the value as it sure. proceeds forward. Okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. Could Thank that you. Could be included in her uh, monthly report to us? <coughs> I'd like a little. I'd, I'd like a little bit more detail than we normally would get on that in a monthly report. But monthly. Yeah. Yeah. Or okay. maybe even at the policy committee meeting. At the policy committee. Yeah. Well, committee. we're shoving more and more things into that meeting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Very. Um, it's an exciting committee meeting. <coughs> We're going to make it so. Yes. Yes. Not to be missed. Is is the, are they ready? I apologize. Thank you, Brian, yeah, for saving the day. Okay. So uh, we're going to talk just, about. Let me just finish the, the last thing. I just, oh. the, the one last thing on uh, the policy committee that we conducted was we initiated some discussions with regards to updates to our policy 530, with regards to our hiring process and criteria. Okay. okay. Thank you. All set? Yeah. All okay, set. Here we go. Sorry. And I advance by sliding? Yeah, on the side. Scroll or hit the arrow. It's not, it's not okay. Arrow. So we're going to talk about instructional <coughs> time in District 96. Here we go. So uh, some people have already seen this. These are pupil attendance days in neighboring uh, high-performing districts. Chicago Public Schools goes to school 181 days. River Forest, 177. Oak Park, Hinsdale, LaGrange. 176. And just to be clear, I did look at LaGrange's calendar. That's 176 full days, no half days. Let this current year that we just finished, District 96 went for 175. Next year, we're planning on 174 for two more parent teacher conference days. So we are two days below neighboring districts. Our school ranking has fallen. We've already heard about that. Uh, looking at the school district as a whole, we are now 127 out of 724. We have the shortest school year and the shortest school day, and I'll show you that now. Do we really want to lose more time? So this chart I sent to the board already, and our instructional time committee looked at it. So here's our ranking, 127. If you could see, Western Springs is 11, River Forest is 26. Those two school districts were, were ranked in the top 30 by Chicago Magazine last year. Both of those schools have about 10 minutes a day or almost an hour a week more of school than we do. Western Springs Middle School has two hours a week more. River Forest, you see Oak Park Elementary and LaGrange are the two neighboring districts that have early release. Even with their early release, they are going to school longer than our kids are. Uh, and keep in mind, by Illinois Report Card, Hauser students have 80 minutes a week less of math instruction and 88 minutes of reading. So that's two hours below the state average at Hauser. And our minutes are lower and our days are fewer. So we have two days less than neighboring schools. We have a shorter school day for about an hour a week times 35 weeks. That's a total of 35 hours. There's six instructional hours in a day. That's six days. We're shorter. With early release, we're losing 30 hours. There's six instructional hours in a day because we're taking out lunch and maybe advisory or breaks or things like that. So that's five more days lost. So we add two plus six plus five. That's 13 days we will be losing next year. That's two and a half weeks. 
That's seven and a half percent less time that our teachers are going to have to teach Common Core. That's seven and a half percent time that our students are going to have to learn Common Core. Teachers, I've I feel sorry for you, you're going to be evaluated on kids' test performance. How are you going to do that in 7.5% less time? That, that's concerning. And the lost value to our district. It currently costs $7.50 per hour per child to educate a person in our district. Multiply the number of enrolled students this year times 30 hours. That's an instructional cost of $365,000 that we are losing that the taxpayers are paying for education for our students that we are losing. And there's other hidden costs. Dr. Sharma Lewis in one of her documents calculated early release would cost about $43,200. That's going to be paid for by parents. Crossing guards, we're adding an extra hour a week. That's going to be paid for. And parents mix time at work. So. The administration presents recapturing time in the school day. Let's capture an hour by TDPE. Let's capture, bring back uh, advisory and take away announcement time. Okay, if we have inefficient time in our day, we need to recapture that regardless of early release. We're seeing where we're falling. We need to get that time. We need to be efficient and effective in our time in the classroom. We cannot afford to lose any more time. Regardless of early release, that time needs to be recaptured. So our options from our stand of the committee was option one was actually Art Perry's idea. Add 15 minutes to the school day, Tuesday to Friday, to make up for the instructional loss. The teachers union said absolutely we cannot do that, and that's debatable depending on the contract. Uh, we see in the contract seven hours and 10 minutes. Currently instruction time, six hours and 50 minutes. I guess that's for the attorneys to argue. Option two, professional development currently exists in the teacher's contract. It's stated in their contract that they should be paid $36 an hour for professional development. Okay, the benefit of that is it can happen in larger blocks of time and we know professional development is more effective in larger blocks of time. It could be done summer, after school, weekends. I'm pleased to see all the teachers here taking their time. Obviously, if something's important to you, you're gonna make an effort to be there. And I believe this is important to the teachers, so I believe they will want to be there and they will be paid for it. All right? If not, if they can't, they don't think it's important and they don't want to show up, then it goes in their evaluation. And maybe we need to figure out who is very committed to Common Core and who is very committed to our students. Maybe that will help our ranking go up. So the school board has heard well from teachers. They've heard well from the administration that is very much in support of the teachers and the teachers union. They've heard from the PTO that's very much in, in support of the teachers. But I think the board's responsibility is to the taxpayers, the parents, and all of our responsibility, as has been well stated today, is to the students. I don't know why I can't get that last one. <laughs> but um, I believe and I think our group believes we need more instruction time, not less. I think professional development should happen, but not at the expense of student time in the classroom. I think we need more time on task, not less. Thank you. Thank you, um, Karen. All right. Mary Rose is part of the committee. Can I come in as well? Um, I, no. Uh, no um, why not? Why not? Why not? I would like I would like to I would like to make that open that invite to the people who actually took the time to be on the committee. I, I, I'm going to gonna, make you a know comment. What? Uh, here's why. Because I mean, this this is on me, the agenda. Um, it's on the agenda right here. All right, I, I get to recognize people. Thank you. And let me answer your question. First of all, what 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 has kind of concerned me a little bit about these uh, is that it's becoming to be one block of parents against or uh, or people against another when we really want to talk about the program that's proposed uh, you know uh, the administration's program versus alternatives and that's my um, you know kind of my concern so if you have if you're going to speak in support of the proposal that's already out there or, um, or if you are you going to offer some a different alternative I just, no I just wanted to clarify what was what was said based on what was said at the committee meeting uh, did, did the administration not present it? Um, is there? Well, because as a committee, we discussed both the options that were presented, and we 
we decided against both those options for what I deem were very good reasons. And, and then a we small were in our group, second meeting. Right? And then a small group came forward and said that they were not for what the committee decided. So I just wanted I, I just wanted to clarify why we in our original meeting had decided that those two options were not viable. All right. Um, all right, Elizabeth. <laughs> so did you well, I mean, if, I mean, yes, no, I'm recognizing you. I'm recognizing you, so you can get up and say it. Well, I just um, get the microphone, please. We we did meet as a committee, and I do um, understand that I was not at the second um, meeting. But when we discussed all three of these options, we discussed the early release option, um, which the superintendent just um, showed us. We discussed the professional development over the summer which um, we had talked about as a group. And while we understood that this was a great, this was great because it recaptured the minutes, we also understood that one, we are not giving teachers enough notice to make plans to be at, a sum at summer or after school if we implement this now. And the other thing is, I'm thinking selfishly of my son. I'm, I think it's great that it would be, we decided that it was great that it would be in the teacher's evaluations if they couldn't make it to professional development that doesn't help my second grader who has a teacher that's not in professional development that that doesn't help me you know if, if that teacher has a ding in their evaluation that's great I mean they have a ding in their evaluation but that's not helping my second grader or somebody else's kindergartner or somebody else's fifth grader which is why we decided as a committee that that wasn't necessarily a viable option as for recapturing the 15 minutes when we, we had members of the REC at our meeting with us and they explained that they were not willing to open the contract at this point because we are renegotiating another contract. So both of those options were discussed at length at our committee meeting and that's how we came as a committee to the, the presentation that was made by the administration as the committee's meeting, um, as the committee's decision. And then I think what Dr. Foley presented was the dissenting opinion from that committee. So I just wanted to clarify that, that we, to disagree. Okay. Yes. Uh, yes. And this is again. I, I again. I, I don't really want dueling. You know. No. I just wanted to clarify where that, that these have been considered by the committee. Yeah. It wasn't. It wasn't. We didn't just consider early release. If no, I may, we, maybe I can shade some clarification on this point. Uh, we had the first committee meeting. And there was no consensus that was achieved at the end of that meeting. There were some proposed ideas about TDPE, and there was an agreement to reconvene at the meeting that we ultimately had the second meeting. The first meeting was kind of contentious. There were different ideas presented, but there was no consensus achieved at that meeting. The second meeting was a lot more cohesive. The administration came forward and presented the idea with the TDP. Ms. Gill uh, spent a lot of time producing an idea for Hauser and going through and looking at that. What was agreed at that second meeting was we respectfully agreed to disagree that there would not be one uniform uh, th uh, statement coming out of that committee. Rather, there would be two separate presentations, and that's what was given here. The agreement was that the union didn't agree with the position, the, the second options presented by Dr. Foley, and uh, we didn't necessarily agree that the TDPE was sufficient to, to cover everything. So what was agreed at the end of that meeting was that there would be two presentations tonight to present our understanding of the mandate was, come give us options, what are the alternatives? What came out of this was three options, one for the administration and the union, and two from uh, a group of parents. They're not, and the point was that n it's not a unanimous statement from the committee. These are three separate ideas coming from the committee, and everybody did a lot of work. And I think the great thing that came out of that committee, the second committee, was we, and as Ms. Koss said earlier, we as a group, as parents, as administrators, and uh, the teachers and everybody agreed that we wanted to move forward. And it was that, Elizabeth, I wish you, I mean, had been there because it was a completely different meeting from the first meeting. But there was a respectful agreement to disagree. That's why we had the two presentations tonight reflecting different options. So I hope that clarifies. Yeah, fortunately the agenda didn't reflect that. 
right. I'm sorry. I, if I could just reflect on this very briefly, I really thank everyone for their input. I mean, hours and hours of work and planning and organization have gone in from teachers, the administration, the REC, parents. Thank you all. Um, to reflect upon the proposal from the administration, I do appreciate the, the, the model that was proposed. We can really, I get a very good idea of how this time will be spent, and I think we, I have been looking for that for a few, a while, and I, I appreciate that. Look forward to hearing about how that progresses. Um, you know, we have a plan. I think that the alternative proposal is all very important, you know, points. I think we've got our work cut out for us going into collective bargaining, and we need to just constantly monitor this. So I, I, that's all I have to say at this point. All right. Um, again, I want to thank everybody for their work. Uh, thanks for the, um, the alternative proposals. Um, and thank you for the administration for, uh, and, uh, and Brian and the REC. You know, we have a jam-packed agenda. We have a gentleman from PMA, and I, who I'm very interested in his presentation. Yeah, but if the board would like to have that presentation, then can we I, I would, I, I would perhaps that? like to do it at another time. Um, it's relevant. I just, it's relevant. I mean, it's relevant. To okay. Patty, how, it. Patty, how much time would you like to take? Time. Four minutes. Okay. All right. Thank you, Patty. The REC would like to respond to points made in Dr. Foley's letter to the board and options one and two, which were presented tonight. First of all, the matters under discussion in options one and two do constitute collective bargaining. The options discussed are a change of working conditions. In option one, adding 15 minutes to the workday is a change of working conditions. In option two, evaluating teachers based on their attendance at after hours professional development is also a change of working conditions. Dr. Foley references section 15.1 of the contract in her letter to you. The second sentence of section 15.1, complete understanding of the contract states, the terms and conditions may be altered, changed, added to, deleted from, or modified only through the voluntary mutual consent of the parties, REC and the Board of Education, and written amendment and executed according to the provision of this agreement. Let's go on. Section 15.2, Negotiations, Acknowledgement, and Waiver, states, second sentence from the end, changes in the certified employee's workday, preparation time, junior high weekly assignments, and formal certified suspensions policy shall be subject to negotiations. Let's go on. Section 1.2, Recognition Clause. The board recognizes the union as the sole and exclusive bargaining representative for all full-time and regular part-time certified personnel and all full-time and part-time paraprofessionals and goes to define on who else we represent. My point is that the Recognition Clause states again that if either side wants to do anything related to wages, hours, or working conditions, it needs to be bargained. By definition from the Illinois Education Labor Relations Act, IELRA, the the purpose of the collecting bargaining unit is to bargain on wages, hours, terms, and conditions of employment. The ideas put forth in options one and two are terms and conditions of employment. So back to Dr. Foley's group proposal, yes, option one with extending the school day for 15 minutes is a term of employment that is a mandatory subject of bargaining. Option two has a condition of employment as well, with the idea of staff being penalized in the evaluation if they cannot attend the professional development after school hours. Dr. Foley's group has a different interpretation of the contract. Sentences are taken out of the context of the entire paragraph. When a contract is read, it must be read with the intent and within the context of the entire paragraph or section. The REC has passed bargaining proposals from 2010 which show the intent of Section 511 Workday. Since 2010, there's been a new administration, a new board, and a new law firm twice. The REC remains the only party present when the original intent of the workday was negotiated. I also like to point out section 11.1 .1 of the contract. This section outlines the procedure when parties, meaning the REC and the Board of Education, have a difference of opinion on the interpretation of the contract. The section explains the formal process of settling differences. Step four goes to arbitration. Arbitration will involve time and much money. Some cases have gone on for months. 
The REC stance is that we will negotiate the workday in our next contract. We will address professional development in our next contract. The current contract expires in June of 2015. We hope to start negotiating in fall. Our team has been ready since May 1st. Bill Howes and Helen Bryan, who will be on the negotiating team, explained to Dr. Foley's group and the committee that the REC will negotiate in good faith on this topic of the workday. I looked up the definition of good faith, which says it encompasses a sincere belief that negotiations will occur without malice or the desire to defraud others. The union is hereby on record that it has no intention of bargaining in anything but good faith. We have every belief the board will do the same. In closing, data proves that the quality of the teacher affects students learning the greatest. We are asking for this hour a week to improve our quality of teaching. We do not sacrifice instructional time lightly. We are professionals, and we are a union of professionals. Thank you. Um, thank you, Bill. Um, can you send um, the board a copy of that? Can you send um, what you read? Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. And um, thank you. Um, all right. Um, this, I guess, we would like to move on. Maybe in new business, uh, you know, we can discuss. <laughs> Um, to take up uh, whether uh, well the, if the committee is officially closed is that and the board will just have to uh, discuss if they want to do anything with it and it's not on our agenda today um, but I do want to thank everybody for their participation I think this is an important conversation uh, people are have wondered why we allowed the, I personally allowed this to continue after the vote and this or after our vote on April 15th and it's because I believe this instruction time and the length of our day and the uh, the length of um, our school calendar and the length of our day was a revelation to me and um, I think it is very important that we look at that carefully and I do think putting a dollar amount on the lost tax dollars uh, 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 that the taxpayers are paying for instructional time that the children are not getting is a very powerful statement and it got my attention and I believe it will get the attention of, of the taxpayers who are not in this room and um, and I, I, I believe it deserves to have their attention so uh, I want to thank everybody for their work um, no, no promises on what we will be able to do um, you know this year um, uh, but I am pleased that we were able to capture uh, uh, you know um, that we have proposals that enable us to capture the time so I want to thank everybody and um, so I'm not clear so there was a proposal from the administration to recapture some of it through the loss of TDPE. So I guess maybe and I'm not saying we didn't extend our day as if some people had hoped. No, but are they looking for direction from the board on whether or not to proceed, or are they proceeding with it, or what's happening with? I, I would like to uh, maybe discuss that later in the evening, or um, so that's what you want to uh, talk about in new business. Yes, but I would like to do it with the stronger with uh, the other board members <coughs> present as well. But right now, the you know this the administration has the ability to 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 implement this proposal right, that they should. Okay. because they control the day, you know the school day. So, um, right? Do we all agree on that? Yes. Yes. Yep. Okay. All right. We're good. All right. You know, unless there's some other action of the board not to um, to direct them otherwise. To direct them otherwise. So that thank you for for asking that okay. question so we can be clear. All right. Thank you uh, and. Um, I would, um, as to where we are next on the agenda, we do have a gentleman from PMA here who's been patiently waiting, um, and um, and there might be some very interesting things coming out of this discussion. Um, uh, well, I know there will be, uh, and then we will later on go back to the committee reports. <coughs>
tricky time. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, good evening, and uh, I'd like to uh, present this evening a uh, result of work that we've done with the administration using PMA's financial planning Excuse program. Me, you, um, could repeat your name, please. Sure. Um, it's Howard Kraus. I'm Thank Senior you. Vice President for PMA Financial Network. Okay. Our uh, financial planning program is used in about 180 districts across the state, primarily in the Collar counties, uh, looking at a variety of information and with uh, bringing together probably two to 3,000 assumptions in various forms uh, to project where the course of the finances of the district would be based on those assumptions. So what I'd like to do this evening is just recap where we are with a base model and then talk about some of the uh, sensitivity analysis uh, that Zach and I did in particular with some of the most critical factors for the district because that allows you to understand the relative impact of some of the major assumptions versus some of the more minor ones. So, uh, okay, I have to uh, adjust. The, uh, the projections are typically based on the current year's budget, so or FY14, and that is the basis. However, uh, Zach is uh, reviewing the current set of expectations for FY15 budget, particularly as it deals with what we know of staffing and staffing costs plus some other uh, expenditure issues that are built into FY15 that would be reflective of the current uh, work to put the FY15 budget together and then we're projecting forward from that as well. We do have the current tax extension. Uh, levy year 13 came out just a few weeks ago in Cook County and then we'll talk about what existing EAV did and the impact that has on tax rate as well as new property in the district and the impact that has on increased taxes available to the district. Uh, we're looking at enrollment, we're projecting staffing forward, including additional staffing proposed and accepted for next year, uh, compensation and benefits, the current contract, some assumptions about that are placeholders for salary negotiations into the future, and the other district assumptions that impact those projections. This is your current operating budget, and although we're close to the end of the fiscal year, uh, I believe Zach would tell you we're, you're expecting to come in very, very close to budget, both in revenue and expenditures. The important part here is that the district in the state of Illinois is property wealthy, and the majority of your revenue, of course, comes from local property taxes, almost 87% a small portion from other local fees, uh, a very small portion, 3% generally from general state aid, and another 5% from the state for categorical payments, uh, and a very small percentage for federal dollars. So the most critical assumptions to the revenue stream are about what happens with local property taxes and, and to a lesser extent what happens with general state aid. Though I will get into, at the very end, some observations about general state aid and some of the legislation that's been proposed and some of the other factors that potentially impact that down the road. The uh, key revenue assumptions then, we really do start with those major ones. You know that when you adopted your levy for 2013, that the consumer price index that you used to determine accessible funds was 1.7 percent. In January, the CPI, Consumer Price Index, that will impact this upcoming December's levy was established at 1.5 percent. And the assumption is a very relatively conservative 1.9 percent in future years. And, and the, uh, in discussions 
with Dr. Sharma Lewis, with Zach. Uh, the intent on the revenue side, as it is with most districts, was to be relatively conservative. Uh, that the surprises there would typically be to the better, so that you understood that. Um, on the expenditure side, it's similar. Uh, the, the conservative estimate of expenditures usually is hoping that you are expecting expenditures down the road to come in lower than we're projecting. That's very common among our districts um, to take a more, uh, not pessimistic, but perhaps realistic view of the assumptions. And you'll see the impact of some of that as we go through. Uh, could you Please. Get the, C the CPI, is that a, a national CPI or a state? Is it specific to our state? It is the Bureau of Labor Statistics Consumer Price Index year over year from January 1 to December 31. It's the CPIU, the all urban uh -huh. uh, CPI. There are about 15 different CPIs. That's the one prescribed in the property tax extension limitation law. The tax. But it's looking at prices, changes in prices in various goods across the nation. It is. Okay, it's not specific to It Illinois. is not localized. Okay. Uh, Any idea why that, why not? I mean, well, I mean, yeah, I, I'm afraid I was way too close to the conversations in 1993 and 94 when the property tax cap came in. Uh, they wanted a measure that was, because at that point, areas like Riverside, like uh, Elmhurst and so forth, Glen Ellen, areas where property values were escalating far faster than uh, wages and salaries were increasing and far faster than the cost of living. And so to put a cap on how much taxes could increase, they came back to a measure generally accepted, uh, whether it's uh, for adjustable rate mortgages, for uh, how federal dollars for low income increases, to some extent how Social Security was to increase. And they, so, and they picked that measure then as one that was uh, as generic as possible, I would guess. Uh, and so that that common factor was the one built into the, the cap. I'm guessing law. a more localized CPI could hurt or help you depending on the well, year. Right, but, but it, it's more it may accurate. Change, the variability precision. may be higher yeah, than something averaged out across yeah, the Yeah, now you're at a national, and so many factors go into it that don't pertain to us here in terms True, of. But right. You know, but ultimately, and, and that's an issue at the, the very local level. Yeah. But ultimately, at the state level, they picked that measure as the amount, as the uh, factor that would increase dollars available sure. through property taxes. And so that's the one you're measuring anything else against, yeah. uh, any other choices. Yeah, I totally under I get the, the impact it yeah. has. It's just, you know, the use of that national number just seems inappropriate. If we could rewrite state laws, oh, yeah. a lot of what's going on today was an unexpected consequence of the way the law was written. Yeah. For example, the EAV drop, the equalized assessed valuation drop, con uh, that also ran with a drop in the multiplier used in Cook County for EAV, mm -hmm. uh, amounted to a 6.8% drop in your tax base for uh, your tax extension for levy year 13. Any time, and, and here's the unintended, unexpected, because they never anticipated that property values would go down, uh, especially back in 1993, 94. Uh, the unintended uh, consequence is any time EAV goes down or doesn't increase as much as the CPI, the tax rate to generate the dollars to which you have access based on the tax cap law must increase. So that's why you've seen, despite the fact that property values have gone down, despite the fact that you only will receive 1.7% more dollars if you fully extend this year, your tax rate is going up at approximately 6.8% plus uh, 1.7 percent, or almost eight, what is eight and a half percent increase in the rate, simply because of the way the tax cap works. Um, so, 
a one tenth of a percent CPI increase generates a plus or minus $23,000 approximately in your operating taxes. So if, if it had been 1.5 next year, you would not receive $46,000 less money, but it, the increase would be $46,000 less than it was this year. It's sort of circular, but I don't mean to confuse the issue, and, but I think most of you understand and so we just but if you have questions I'll continue that 23,000 that that number is for our district based on our EAV right and your tax rate against your okay. Uh, EAV okay uh, new property this year was only hundred eighty four thousand dollars as you'll see that's one of the lowest numbers you've had in recent years uh, it is projected to increase to two million dollars for next year and then one million dollars each year that's more of a return to the norm, uh, which I believe would reflect that just a consensus uh, that property values have bottomed out. Now, I say that, however, uh, knowing that Cook County's triennial reassessment has a very different impact. We're assuming that this was the reassessment this year uh, and that the next years down the road, we've kept at a flat EAV of zero change. With that in mind, the only thing that would change is what projected tax rate would be to generate the dollars to which you have access under the cap. Okay. I One million. That, yes. I was just going to say, I think that one hundred eighty-four thousand dollar new property. I think it, that was my house addition. That kind of. <laughs> <laughs> Could I come live there? That kind of went went <laughs> over budget. <laughs> Um, and, and just again, as a rule of thumb for you with your current rate, a million dollars of new property generates an additional uh, $48,000. So even going to $2 million for next year, we're not talking about a, 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 a really large increase. We're talking potentially a, a $98,000 or so. When we're talking property, it's a commercial and residential? It is. New property, it doesn't matter which. Now, this next point, I, we have to put in some context. We're using a, an average of 97% for tax collection. And the reason we've done that is uh, knowing the area, there have been significant uh, property tax appeal board decisions in the area, particularly in the last few years. They've tapered off a little bit. And so to account for that and the exposure the district seems to have to uh, those reductions in EAV that result in not getting taxes uh, that you might have received, we left it at 97%. Where you're, if, if that were not a factor, you'd probably be closer to a 99% or so. And so this is not indicating that people don't pay taxes, but rather that you have exposure to having to, to the county uh, keeping taxes back to repay people who've successfully appealed at PTAP. And those are individual residencies versus, or it's, it, it's commercial or residential? It is either <laughs> or, but of course the bigger ones right. tend to be uh, warehouses. Just in the big box stores. Correct. And so on and so forth. Okay. So a lot of explanation there, but uh, since that's your most critical factor, we thought we should spend a little more time. Uh, general state aid, uh, we're projecting that the foundation level will stay flat, but be prorated at 89% a year. That reflects the current budget for FY15 is right at about 89%. Uh, it assumes no changes to the formula, and we'll come back to that statement at the, at the end because of the potential exposure. For Does the that district. mean that it's 89%, it's the same amount every consecutive year, or is it each year 89%? previous year it's it's 89% of what you are in uh, the formula says you're entitled to okay but the proration says they haven't funded it fully so you only get 89% of what you should get okay Is it important? no relation to the prior years of distribution yeah, yeah. Understood. Thanks. Uh, so here's the picture of EAV growth uh, this is total EAV including new construction you see we believe you bottomed out. Uh, that's our assumption based on this. We have to start getting 
and new growth uh, the prior years before 2012 and 13 were much higher uh, hoping it perhaps hoping more so than anything that we will bounce back and then flatten it back out at a more traditional 1 million general state aid revenue this reflects uh, from 2010 on the amount received by the district through 2014 and you see that the, e, the general state aid, even though the proration is the same, is expected to be less than what you received that year. That reflects as much the uh, declining enrollment as anything. Wait. Small declines in enrollment. Well, so here's, well, yes. I wonder where you get that though. What's, you, which is that? The declining enrollment, enrollment. projections. Uh, we'll talk about that if we could in just a couple okay. minutes. Okay. Um, the operating budget on the expenditure side, the majority of your dollars, like every school district, is salaries and benefits, about 70%. That would be larger, but you do outsource some of your services, and so uh, contracts for, uh, that you pay out to a service provider, whether it's transportation or, or custodial, for example, or food service, are in the purchase service section. If they were your employees, then the, the percentage for salaries and benefits would be bigger. Uh, the expenditure assumptions. Now, we have generally held these flat over the next five years with these exceptions. Uh, Ed fund purchase services, which include tuition costs, are increasing at 5% a year in the model. The capital outlay is reduced in FY15 after major expenditures in FY14 then held flat. The operation and maintenance fund purchase services, again, were reduced. There were some uh, major renovation construction projects that were included in the FY14 budget, so the purchase services have been reduced and then held flat, uh, as has, uh, but capital outlay is increased in FY15 and then increasing at 5% a year. Uh, that's more reflective of the uh, attention that you would like to pay to your buildings to maintain. Transportation fund contract increasing at 5% a year. Uh, and then uh, the tort fund purchase services are held flat in 15, but increasing at 3%. That includes your property casualty, general liability, workman's comp, uh, and other uh, uh, permitted services in tort. The salary expenditures are uh, the current contract through FY15 is included. Uh, with future years to be negotiated, so we simply have a placeholder in there. Uh, enrollment projections and programming needs are influencing the staffing, and so we're at, we've built in uh, a net staffing increase of 10.67 full-time positions or full-time equivalents for 15, primarily uh, because you're bringing some special ed services in-house, reorganizing delivery of services as, as well as student support for your population. Uh, speaking of which, uh, so on. I had a question on the transportation fund. We say that we're assuming an increase in 5% per year. Does that consider um, our efforts to take a hard look at all our outplacement, outplaced students that we're trying to bring back, as well as your efforts on like the field, the bus hiring of bus services? Yes. Yes. All yes. oh, that's factored in? This year from Okay. Great, great, great. Thanks. In fact, uh, did we not reduce the expenditures in 14, which I didn't mention there, okay. but the, because uh, Zach anticipates the actuals are going to be less than budget by 180 some thousand. Yeah. Uh, and then it's, but that's what's then increasing at five percent. We do anticipate. Uh, we've used the assumption of health benefits increasing at eight percent annually. Again, part of the placeholders for negotiations. So do we have a, a general, uh, is this the salaries and the health benefits, is this is increasing at a faster rate than all the other expenditures? So we should be on that pie chart, this will become a bigger and bigger percentage? Yes, it would. Yeah. Yeah. Particularly as some of the other categories are held flat. Yeah. David, could you repeat your question? And just, like, so so I just want confirmation. So if, if salaries and health benefits are increasing at a greater rate than the other expenditure categories, then on the pie on the pie chart here, this would just be coming a bigger bigger wedge. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I just wanted to have it repeated to make sure I understood it. Thank you. So the the enrollment projections 
are essentially keeping kindergarten flat and moving the grade levels down. And so you have some of your larger classes are in your upper grades. And so as they move forward and you have fewer kindergartners coming in, then your enrollment is going down. And that's the only uh, set of assumptions we have. If we have better, then we would change that. And our staffing then is tied after these additional positions are put in to those enrollment projections. I, I just question that assumption. I, you know, we've had many discussions about increasing enrollment. We're at our absolute peak, over 1,600 kids in the district, which I, I've got data from 1966 that we haven't been at that level ever uh, in this district. And I, I would like to say that that, um, that assumption is perfectly correct. I just am very skeptical. Yeah, what we learned is that a lot of that growth doesn't happen at the kindergarten level. It right. happens at the you know third, fourth, fifth, First. sixth, you know, and First. we see we see mm -hmm. these classes growing as they actually move up. We're getting kids come in from out of other districts out, out of state, out of country coming in. And, and just my just give you a little bit of why I'm so skeptical. We've had a demographer do work in the district in the past and completely Missed. missed the boat mm -hmm. on, on those predictions. So I'm, again, I'm just sorry, I'm just very skeptical. And, and we have no skin in this game. Okay. So we did this as a choice between, uh, because they're lacking a demographer, yeah. what seems to be obvious reasons, okay. uh, study, uh, to say there are a couple of ways that just based on what you have, you can calculate what the anticipated changes would be. The simplest way is the way we input in the model. We can look at a cohort method that simply is mathematical of what's happened over a three-year period or a five-year period, how much growth or decline occurs by grade level. But that is a different way of guessing. Mm -hmm. The real key ends up for any K-8 district is trying to, to make some assumption about what's going to happen to kindergarten classes. And there's, there's very little good way of measuring what your kindergarten class three years from now is going to be. So in other districts that you work with, uh, are, are, are you seeing or not seeing other uh, evidence of like the fifth grade class just jumped up 20 kids? Mm -hmm. Are you seeing that in other districts? Or? Uh, other districts have some variance and we see often um, for districts that do not have full day kindergartens, that the first grade enrollment right. jumps because students are coming from uh, mm -hmm. daycare kindergarten situations right. and enrolling we see in that first here. grade. We see that so we here. see that. So here. we have that here. Right. Uh, we see at times, it, you know, the the high school district sees a dramatic change as students uh, enrolling from parochial grade schools go into the high school. You don't have that issue per se. There usually is a change in population um, at the transition from your grade schools to your junior high. Uh, that is very common among districts that that may increase as students, as parents enroll their students from a parochial or from some other uh, program into junior high for a variety of reasons, not the least of which tend to be extracurricular. So we, we simply chose to take somebody who is moving okay. things down. I'm, I'm perfectly willing to hear you out, that's fine. I just want to be able to help have you help us think through mm -hmm. how to think about these assumptions and, and maybe if we have different assumptions, how does the model reflect? Uh, that's the perfect question. Okay. Because in each of these, this is a very uh, interactive model. So if we said, let's go back and look at more of a cohort method over the last three years, and not just accounting for a change at first grade, but looking at every grade level, we could input that and say, here's how that scenario plays out versus the current one. Right. Uh, as new information becomes available, then we input that as well. And all of the assumptions uh, I can change in conversation with, with Bob No, with Zach, or uh, we put it into a web-based model where Zach can do that on the fly as he chooses. Fine. 
So we can say, all right, so for a kindergarten class mm -hmm. of 100, that what we've seen in over a course of so many years, that from kindergarten to eighth grade, that on average, it's been increasing by, that that group has increased in size by 20%. Mm -hmm. And we can put that, we can plug that in. Yes. Hmm. Okay. We have the data. I mean, yeah, we, we yeah. absolutely do, so. It's just trying to decide with historical data how to interpret that going forward. Right. Yeah. But it's very easy to change. Okay. Thanks. That's why we talk about this as a base as opposed to this is it, okay. so that we can you can see the change that's available. So Thanks. for this presentation, this is the suggestions yes. you made. How how um how were the assumptions arrived at? Uh, the three of us sat down and talked through what we knew. Uh, what we were anticipating and then made some decisions for example with the enrollment how best to capture uh, what we know uh, with the enrollment assumptions are you looking also at surrounding districts around us of what's happening there or to some, some extent uh, no. to for example with EAV we, we certainly have our experience of some of the surrounding areas with the, uh, the property tax collection uh, it was reflective of the conversation I've had multiple times with the, the 208 board, mm -hmm. uh, what we see in some of the other districts. So what, what I can bring to that conversation of what we know, we've, we've considered. And, and just on the enrollment issue by itself, other neighboring districts don't necessarily well, have the same right. Oh, happening. sure, sure, sure. So yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I yeah. Mean, but maybe the other factors, EAV and housing uh -huh. values and so and on. And then, you know, like other districts and how they try to figure this out whole enrollment change over year over time that they have some creative yeah but yeah. I would agree with art I think we're different yeah. very different than what's happening with districts around us so it's hard for us to use that but as we, a model. From there, we might be similar to Western Springs though don't you think yeah. Yeah. no no, I don't. no we're not no yeah. But anyway, from, I don't. I don't think but, we can but definitely oh, from right. that you have to sit there and go what all right so we got to figure out why you know, it's got to be something in there and be able to. We need a crystal ball. That's <laughs> what I thought we were getting. tried that one. I thought you got your order. <laughs> I thought that was Amazon. It's between you know? the crystal ball and the magic eight ball. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, when you said here you've got uh, the fiscal year 14 expenditures by object operating funds, is this just budget data put in or are there any actuals for this year? The majority of our budget, but at the numbers that I knew were going to address the issue from the budget analyst, we went with the year. Actual. And I guess I guess the salaries are actuals. I think we've talked to yes. that before, and so that's the biggest driver. Yes. Yeah. Salaries and benefits. Salaries and benefits, mm -hmm. and those are probably actuals. And then what other actuals might it be in here? And transportation was was one of them. Uh, the, uh, as far as the expenditures for transportation. Um, I had budgeted 860, uh, and that's not the number we use because we saw where we were uh, at the end of May compared to budgeting. We're way below uh, what we were even at last year. Well, slightly below last year, but way below our budget number. And what would be again in the purchase service? That's the you know, uh, purchase services. What sort of uh, the big chunk of purchase service for Ed Fund? The big chunk is special ed, and it's you know, the outgoing our Okay. okay. Thank you. Sure. Uh, so with the staffing projections, you see the jump projected uh, with approved positions for next year in FY15, and then as at, from that point forward, as enrollment projections were expected to go down, the staffing was going down. Uh, proportionately so we're bringing this together in several forms uh, this page is more of the accounting view of it but there are several critical numbers that I would point out we're looking at the revenues by those categories state local or local state federal and other uh, we're looking at the expenditures breaking out salary and benefit costs we do have uh, the, on the salary side we have the current scattergram for your staff 
for FY14, including identifying the retirees and their salaries that are, and retirees in the future increasing per the contract. Uh, we were able to know, to put in what we know of the scattergram information for FY15 with the people who have currently been hired, which significantly uh, tightened up the projection uh, for FY15 salaries. And then we put those other factors together. So in that middle line, the surplus and deficit, that's the first one to look at. That's revenues versus expenditures for the year. And as we said, they, the projections tend to be conservative. And so like most districts, the trend is for that surplus in 14 to shrink as you move forward until you, you project forward into a deficit projection. The revenues are pretty well what they will be. I mean, the, the, the biggest factor there is what will be the consumer price index that impacts FY17 and beyond. Because FY16, the CPI is known with that 1.5%, um, assuming taking advantage of the full extension. All right, sorry. Full extension, right? So Correct. that's important. This board did, elected did not increase our extensions. Right. Here. Um, does that, does your projections extent um, reflect that, our the, most recent tax levy vote? Yes, it does. Okay. But it, it but Going years forward, following, it, 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 assumes it assumes the full extension. The full extension. So that's f 15 and beyond. Uh, or is it 15, 15 is no. the actual from this. Oh, it's 16. Th right, for Sorry. 16 and beyond. Because you gave us the EAV projection. Mm -hmm. Did you give it? What did you give us for CPI? Uh, it's 1.5, of course, for 16, and then 1.9% oh, right. in the following years. Okay. 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 The second one it, then that, that's critical is just highlighting uh, that during the course of this year, you use fund balance for major construction projects and uh, payment of the debt certificates and you see the, the annual payment projected forward there in that line that says other financing uses where you're transferring money from your operating funds to your debt service fund to make that payment. This does not include the debt service fund as part of your operating. Okay, So that's why that's showing and then the net result of that is that surplus and deficit including those other financing sources which is what reduces your fund balance uh, annually. And so your fund balance going from approximately 31 million at the beginning of the year to approximately $23 million in your budget uh, at the end of FY14 and then decreasing over time. However, the next one that, you, that is critical for a lot of your conversation is that bottom line and that's the percentage of dollars compared to your expenditures. How many, what, what percent of your expenditures in the year do you have in fund balance on June 30th? And you see it's decreasing, but even over time with this set of projections, you have uh, at about six months of expenditures in the bank in this projection in FY19. Do you guys now, have a recommendation on the bottom line? Sort of. of um, it, it's really a combination of factors. One is the state says you've got to have 25% of your expenditures to be in the top. Well, that's fine and dandy, um, but that uh, doesn't take into account the distribution of tax dollars in Cook County. A couple of years, is it now three years, I think, that Cook County, this will be the third year, that Cook County has distributed taxes in August, September, when they are, the law says they will <coughs> distribute them. Uh, the year before that, you got them on December 1st. And so the, the factor for how much you should have in the bank on June 30th when your auditors close the books is a comfort zone for you of how much should we have to make sure that we have enough money in the bank if Cook County again delays 86% or 43% of your revenues until December rather than September. So that your cash flow, what we, what we 
don't want to see a district do, if we can help it, is get to that point where they're having to borrow externally to meet your cash obligations at some point during the year. And if you're down that low, you're probably not going to get a very favorable rating, bond rating, and you're probably not going to get a very competitive interest rate. Actually, it, it's no. because most of it's very short term. Mm -hmm. you're, you're paying it back when the taxes come in or within six to eight months. Okay. Um, it, it doesn't have as big of an impact on the rate that you're paying. Okay. And the, the bond rating is more about the overall uh, status of the district. But if from where you are, you got to the place where you needed to be borrowing, it would indicate you were spending right. far more than you're taking right. in over a, an extended period of time. Not not a little bit You're not going to have a double A rating. Right. Like, unlikely. Yeah. Right? It, it's difficult. Yeah. Now, I also, I think your colleague, Tammy, helped us devise <laughs> a fund balance policy, which I believe is 40%. 40% of, of what expenditures? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. Art, can you talk a little bit about um, sort of the uh, sort of the work that was done to develop that policy and how Tammy? And, and the, I guess I'm gonna I'm just gonna ask a question here. Sure. Can you write a report that basically says what that where I can read what you're talking about now, where you might define terms, or is that part of what we're getting here, or, or is all we're really <coughs> getting is a uh, is a slide. I mean, is this the output of the? This is the generic. This is not the generic. This is the typical output for board presentation where I have 20 to 25 minutes. Mm -hmm. But in terms of a glossary of, of terms and more detailed, we can certainly do some of that for you. And, and also, some of the things that you've said and how we use this information. Um, yeah, I mean that's I'm trying to get a little bit in a little bit more depth than we're getting here. Mm -hmm. So what's the forum? Um, you know, what's a typical forum for doing that? And that goes back to my question that um, Art, uh, you know, that I just asked of Art. Sure. Well, it's always difficult to give too much depth during a board meeting, mm -hmm. simply because you've got it's you know ten o'clock and you've still got an hour's worth of work and you know uh, so Ooh, the depth. <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> The depth, in-depth discussion, perhaps it's looking at the vehicles that you as a district have available, whether it's a finance committee, whether it's strategic planning session, whether it's simply a work session, um, or whether it's sitting down one-on-one -on -one and just going through what's there currently. Uh, whatever works for the district works for us. Hey, Mary Rose, I, th I thought that the ISB school finance book that they hand out to us every single year. I, I think it's, good. it's pretty readable. No, yeah, I, I know, know that, but I mean, we're, I, I mean, I know that and I have read those things okay. and I've spent, as you know, I've spent a lot of time on this uh -huh. and my, my, my thirst for information, you know, it runs deeper from PMA. Mm -hmm. This is a tool is that I understand that that can maybe help us with our current collective bargaining. Uh, we maybe uh, are able to to, for example, uh, can I go retrospectively for the last 10 years and look at maybe what we paid teachers 10 years ago, what we're paying them today with the current step systems? Uh, are we able to do that through your model? Um, we don't collect salary schedules backwards. Mm -hmm. What we have simply is from your AFR, your annual financial reports, your audit reports of what was uh, determined to be salary and benefit expenditures in are you are you work, are you working with them in bulk numbers? In other words, just we are retrospectively, yes. Yeah. Okay. Because I was told you could actually put things through, um, you know, steps and lane changes and project the future. What? Uh, yes. Has that been done here? It is. Okay. That, that your this current scattergram, scattergram and the scattergram that we know is in place for FY15, with some placeholders for those positions that have not yet been filled. Mm -hmm minus the people who've left the district, retirees, plus the, the retirement incentive for those who have declared, are all in the model. And then they are moved down each year mm -hmm. in your current schedule based on the assumptions that are there. We, we have to calculate uh, based on your experience, what is it that you think it costs you for lane changes annually? Because that's an increased cost 
that's built in as well, plus the new staff that are coming on or the reduction in staff uh, projected based on those enrollment projections. All right. Is there like a, again, a report where you can just, what you just said, put it in writing to accompany this? Sure. Okay. <laughs> if yeah, to the extent that we can over a period of time, put that one together. Yes. I mean, there's there's a about 95 pages of reporting uh, that is available. We just condense this down for the presentation. We definitely but I'm want not sure. Pages. Yeah. What? But I'm not sure that the report itself is is going to answer your questions without some going through it. <laughs> No, I know, but al but or. also even for some of these, like uh, even for the eleven, this um, that that particular projection, can you you know provide some kind of a narrative that explains your assumptions and the output and yeah. yes, okay, yes, thank you. Sure. <laughs> Uh, so then we condense that, what you just saw, into uh, this page. The red line indicates that aggregate fund balance in those operating funds in your, from your annual financial report from 2009 through 2013 and the projected fund balance at the end of 14. So that's where that, that second dip is FY14 right there in the middle. And then the line moving forward reflects this current set of projections and where your fund balance would be through 2019. This is the quick version, uh, the quick way of seeing, or a one that just truncates it to FY14 to 19, that says, if I change this assumption, what happens to that line? And, and that's the way that you get that quick response of, if, if CPI is 4%, mm -hmm then your line's going to be you know, up. If it's 1%, then you're going to continue to see a bigger decline, for example. And, and that's the, the shorthand version of seeing the impact of change of some assumption. Can you just explain the, the bar graphs on the bottom sure. for each year? Yes. The, uh, the, the set of bars on the left is your education fund. And the yellow bar is the fund balance in the education fund in 2014 at the end of the year. Okay. So if you added the yellow bars up for each of the six funds, you would come up with the 23 million uh, fund balance in the FY14. But it's showing the contours of the fund balances right. over the time. One of the problems that you're going to face and you, is, again, this impact of the tax cap law and when I said we expected full extension, you've reached your maximum fund rate in the Ed Fund. Mm -hmm. And so you can only levy at $3.50 against your EAV in the Education Fund. The tax cap says you have access to an aggregate amount of dollars. And you're going to find that after you fully extend in Special Ed in the Ed Fund, or fully extend so you make sure you capture in IMRF and Social Security your expenses or, or f extend in working cash or use all of the possible expenses in tort and levy to cover those, that you may still find that you have access to more dollars. And so what we're showing is that the, those dollars would be levied in the transportation fund and ultimately <laughs> transferred to the Ed Fund. That's, that is a a long conversation with the board of how that works and whether that's desirable. Okay. Okay. It's not an immediate issue, uh, so probably not an immediate issue for 15, but it will likely be an issue in 16, 17, and beyond. The alternative is go to referendum and increase that rate, or was no? Was the there, there are a number of choices that you have. You can't exceed the three dollars and fifty cents. Just, that's it. All you can do is increase your maximum levy, mm -hmm. but even at doing that, you don't get more dollars in your Ed Fund because you've reached this the, the, maximum yeah. statutory right. rate. Right. You still and have you to no go longer to another fund to get that money right transferred. Right 
that's a long conversation probably for a finance committee or some very focused discussion a couple at some of years point. From now. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So uh, this is just that short version from FY14 through 19 of what you just saw. Uh, so it's a little different scale, so it's more uh, discernible over a period of time. You can see that though the red line is going down, the blue line is an estimate that, of what you have uh, in uh, September, so it's not very different. Um, this slope is not a major warning sign for us in comparison to other districts. Can you explain the difference between the red and the blue? One sure. Says the FYN blue line balance, and one says low point, right? Right. The, the low point is just a rough estimate of how many dollars you'd have in the bank in September prior to distribution of taxes in September. Okay, I get it now. I got it. Thanks. Okay. Particularly helpful in investing you know, through the treasurer's office. Okay. Financial profile score remains in the top level, that financial recognition level in our projections. And then these are the things that I think are still worthy of, of being aware. Um, your condition increase, your financial condition was significantly better over the last five years and allowed you to spend fund balance to do projects and to commit dollars to those debt certificates. <coughs> Whether it's consolation or not, you look much better than most districts, um, even with what seems to be a declining fund balance. Uh, you see the, the point we talked about in months of expenditures over a period of time. Uh, new construction has been down. It's not stopped completely and every reason to think that this still there's room for improvement there. And then from here on it's all the bad things. <laughs> there's nothing the state will do that will help Riverside 96. To them you are a rich district. Um, you're the you should be taken from and given to somebody else. Senate and Bill the 16. legislation, Senate Bill 16, House Bill 689, the kind of legislation that tries to adjust uh, to send state dollars to the districts that in their measurements need it the most, all would impact the district very negatively. To losing general state aid in it for the most part to having it being half of what you have. So those are things you just have to keep an eye on of, of what that no, is going to happen. Those conversations uh, are going to continue. Eventually there'll be some change in the, the formulas or the way money is distributed. We just don't know exactly when. Uh, we've talked about the major unknowns. Uh, the consumer price index, uh, the biggest factor for your revenues. The pension reform and ultimately what will what I expect to have happen at cost shift that we've talked about for several years where the district would be required to pick up what the state currently isn't paying and, and make those payments on behalf of every dollar that you pay in certified salaries, much like you do in IMRF. Uh, federal budget issues, if they ever come to agreement that we're going to have a balanced budget, then you know, who knows what would happen there. How you still think the cost shift is on the table? Yes, I do. All right. Absolutely. I think that as long as the speaker continues to bring that point up in conversations about the difference between Chicago and downstate, out, out of Chicago, uh, and the state faces major deficits, per, it will be an issue. And if the pension reform legislation is found in major parts to be unconstitutional and the money that they were hoping to save is not there, then FY16 uh, in, for, the, for the state looks extremely difficult. The same with the state income tax. If the state income tax is not renewed, no political statement here, but there's, there's a $6 billion hole in the budget mm -hmm and not many tricks left to fill that as they filled it with tricks this year to supposedly create a balance. So do you think it's possible that they would hit us with both the cost shift and the redistribution of revenue? Yes, I do. Wow. 
And but I mean, that could just financially cripple school districts. Yes. And they would allow that to happen. That's politically viable? Well, it, it comes down to if, if the decision is that we're going to have a legitimately balanced budget and there's not revenue to meet the current expenditure stream, then something has to change. And the more pressure there is to, with less dollars, the more the pressure builds to distribute the dollars that are there to the districts that the state board believe need it more than a Riverside 96. That's a lot of political courage. <laughs> I haven't seen which it. Is, I haven't seen it down in Springfield. Right. Sorry. <laughs> That's why the lame duck session is always oh, so oh, interesting. Yeah, that's cool, yeah. <laughs> oh man. And the, um, is there any? State aid and the uh, uh, cautious is that reflected in your projection? No, it is not. And so uh, I think that's it. Is there no, there's a whole other. Do I have any good news? Yeah, no. leave us on a positive. Okay. Note. Yeah, come on. Uh, <laughs> can I borrow this to remind yeah, myself sure. since I didn't go back to see what the last set of uh, you gonna read the disclaimer on the back? Were. I think it's more of the bad news. Um, <laughs> I think we've talked about the use of for funding major capital projects, uh, your debt certificates, the general state aid we talked about, the maximum tax rates we talked about, and Despite that, with the current set of projections, you are still financially strong, but you have to remain vigilant. Everybody. Well, and that doesn't but. incorporate any of these Springfield. That's right. Stuff. External. That's right. right. Which. No, you can't predict them. No, we just can be afraid of them. <laughs> yeah, that's about it. So, uh, but I guess my other question um, is: there any discussion of? of when they shift the pension, that they'll uh, you know the pension shift, that they'll also give us a mechanism to tax, uh, to raise property taxes to deal with it. The uh, the hopeful people or the wishful thinkers bring that up. It will not happen, in my opinion. Uh, the speaker has said multiple times since the Republicans passed the tax cap legislation in 1993, 94, that you passed it, you live with it. Um, he's, he has a long memory of political payback, and I do not believe that there will be any changes, any exclusions, any additional authority uh, under the tax cap uh, if the pension shift occurs. Wow. Wow. And we don't expect any change in the speaker. Yeah, yeah. I, am. I don't know. When I go in and see Mike, I said it's fine as long as you give us the ability to tax for it. and. So it's not <laughs> fine. And, and he doesn't say, you're right, let's do that, right? <laughs> no, he doesn't. The Mike Madigan magic eight ball. <laughs> no, I just, all right. It's good, you know, I'm glad I asked the question. Right. I was being optimistic, not so much anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Despite the pessimism, you still are financially strong. And, and that's at least the... How do you maintain that? How do you, what do you do over a period of time? To, what do you do to change that line so that ideally it stays flat or it doesn't go down quite as much? And that just extends the time that you have before any financial situation rights itself, if you will. Okay. okay. All right. Can you send us a copy of this electronically? Yes. And um, no, it, we'll post it on the board site. As well. right. We sent it over, put it in the board package. Yeah, and then can you you know send your contact information? Because I'd like to chat with you sure. about about getting more context around this particular presentation. You know, we, you know, I don't know if it's po you know if it's possible or, but um, I'd like to talk to you about that. If sure. And find out whatever whatever the district needs. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank, okay. you. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I guess uh, we can't. Does anybody mind if we take just a five minute break? Oh, or even less? Yes. Please. Yeah, I mean, I drink a lot of water here at these meetings. So. Tonight. At some point, I want to go to bed. All right. Um, well, we've at least passed our minute. Um, you got policy done. And. and um, 
Lisa, can you do a real quick update on uh, finance? Yeah, there was no meeting. Uh, finance committee update is there was no meeting since May 6th. Um, yeah, we have <laughs> not had a meeting since May 6th. The next meeting will be July 15th, and it will primarily focus on the 2014-15 budget. All right. Are you? I, I know you're soliciting um, <coughs> questions or anything that we – are there a list of things you think we're going to address in the budget or – um, Zach is going to give a, an initial presentation of the budget, right. and 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 kind of all the assumptions he's put in to build it. Oh, right, along with the um, management reports. So oh, right. Oh, that I'm very excited. <laughs> <laughs> She'll be. You'll be there. <laughs> oh, I'll be there. So I guess if you have questions, I, I'm I'm not sure what the questions would be though because I think you have to see it first, and it's really going to be the first pass that we'll all get to see it, and we did it in July so that we have enough time to reflect. Okay. All right. Which is way ahead of where we did it last year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I yeah. I agree. We're getting better. What years? Uh, all right. Uh, next, I guess we can. Um, what happened to this? Uh, the guiding principles. Oh, okay. can we just truncate this and just do Pat Barnum and Patty King? Is there some way we can? Sure. I mean, and maybe take the rest of this next month. I mean, we we're talking about another half, and that what we kind of estimated earlier. I mean, if you want to go through I mean, it, no, they want you guys. <laughs> She's like, oh, it's okay if we don't go. And I said, no, they want. No, you <laughs> this is this is I think we should see them. That's what. Yeah, yeah what we're if talking can, about here. I'm sorry for, for this. I'm sorry for this. <laughs> Yeah. Mine too. <laughs> you know, I'm I'm sorry. What we we're discussing here is this uh, portion of the pr presentation is about uh, was estimated to be roughly a half hour, and I asked Bob if we could kind of postpone um, um, Brian and Zach and uh, uh, Don yeah. is going to be speaking to us later mm -hmm. in the evening uh, until next month. But we are very interested in hearing Pat Folland and Peggy King. Um, and their work that they've done here and um, over the past, what, six months? Nine. Nine. Oh, it's been, oh, my gosh. Wow. All right. Well. And if I could just, uh, can I address the, uh, can I address the audience? Sure. Um, in lieu of guiding principles, as um, some of you know that come to our board meetings regularly or watch them, that we give a guiding principles update, which is on our academic and professional excellence, our financial and operational excellence, and our rigorous communication. So what we did for June is to give an overview of the entire year. It's very similar to what I sent out um, to parents and staff um, at the last day of school. So we've pr prepared a PowerPoint giving details of each goal, statement, and outcome. And the reason um, the board wanted to hear from uh, Mrs. King and Ms. Folland is because today is their last meeting. Um, they're leaving on June 30th. They may be doing some days um, throughout the summer to work with Mrs. Shaw, who is going to be our new director of special services. Um, so Pam Shaw is also joining us. So we thought <laughs> just for the sake of time, giving that special ed um, and special services overview, and then if it's okay with Brian, Zach, and Don, um, we can give the rest of our presentation in July. Is that what you're right. asking? Yes, okay. and, and bear in mind that the board has already seen that presentation um, as well, so I'd like to just yeah. postpone it. Um. So, Ms. Shaw, it is, I haven't met you yet. Are you Ms. Shaw? Yes. <laughs> All right. Thank you. So we'll get, we'll, um, and just for, while they're, while uh, Dr. Ian's getting everybody set up, um, to bring everybody up to speed, the guiding principles, and I'm sorry, the guiding principles were um, decided in the January, excuse me, July uh, 2013 board meeting at a special board meeting. The board prioritized the three areas that they wanted the administrative team and staff to focus on. So from there, we came up with um, goal statements, goal statements for each guiding principles. Um, and then staff and administrators um, implemented those guiding principles. And today was going to give uh, provide you with an update of where we are with each and future and suggested next steps. The board is going to be doing some strategic planning this summer and then either evolving or changing or building upon those guiding principles. Um, so we'll be sharing those with you as our progress um, moves forward. But in the meantime, um, we'll come up with that one goal statement 
and then I'll turn it over to Mrs. King and Ms. Volland. Uh, <laughs> Mary Rose, just point of order. Uh, so we won't see, I was very interested to hear from, from our Director of, of Innovation and Technology. He will be so uh, addressing not, us in new business. In new, okay. With future plans, is that? No. Oh. Um, we're going to hear from him. We're going to hear from him. But and a closed session. No, it was going to be an open. We, it may not be on the agenda, but we I have we asked specifically. John, let, let, let me ask you. You are expecting to address us in open session in new business? I, yes, and I, I do have uh, a condensed uh, presentation that will reflect some of the information to discuss. Right, and I, I was sent that by email yeah. earlier today. So... Okay, I mean, I just want to make sure everybody's on the same page. There's also a component of this presentation. Um, there were a couple of items here which was more review, year, year in review, and then the other item is separate, the, uh, the one that you probably got later today. Right, and you can address some of this a little later to the extent it helps us. Why did we get it later today? It'd be helpful if we had this. I mean, I, it's nice to be able to know what's coming later on the agenda. I, I agree. I just uh, we just had some last minute discussions with Bobna about yeah. ab about um, okay. All right. This, this no, I agree on. with I agree with you, but this is the way it is. I think we have uh, maybe a over full agenda tonight, and um, shifting some things around has made some sense to me. All right. Thank you. So our first guiding principle is academic and professional excellence, and our goal statement is that District 96 will ensure innovative and challenging experiences to optimize teaching and learning, and how they relate to um, the area of social services is to foster inclusive learning foster inclusive learning experiences that maximize the least restrictive environment for the LRE. And I have had any. All right, give you an overview. I'm going to. Okay, <laughs> to keep it short. But um, one of the things that we started with was we took a look, and I know we talked about this a little before, but we, we took, took a look at the systems that were in place and then tried to develop some consistency for the things that were most critical to deliver the least restrictive environment for our students. And one of those areas we found was that we were lacking consistent student support teams across the, across the district. Some buildings had them, some had them kind of here and there, so there was no consistency in terms of uh, providing that student support team. And what a student support team is, it's made up of the teachers, the special ed teachers, gen ed teachers, if that's appropriate, and our uh, support staff, which would be your speech therapist, any pertinent person that would come to the table to talk about student needs. Um, typically, it's for students who are in special education, but not necessarily. It's for any kid who's struggling. And then the team talks about their perspective, what they see, and what supports would be appropriate to provide to that student. That could be um, providing response to intervention. It could be to give them more time in a certain subject. Uh, it could be to look at maybe possibly doing an evaluation for special education. But the, the advantage of that is that you have all of the players at the table to talk about that student at one time. So you're not second guessing what somebody else might think or you know others' opinions. So it just streamlines that process and makes it a little bit easier to be a little more comprehensive and consistent with meeting student needs. And then in November of 2013, um, the district provided professional development for, from Paula Kluth to uh, discuss the least, res least restrictive environment. And just to clarify, the least restrictive environment is the least restrictive environment for each individual student. For some students, that means completely included in gen ed with um, maybe a, a pair pro support. It could be uh, a self-contained program that provides them that environmental uh, support that they need. So really that's something that's specific to each individual student. And then um, 
<clears throat> one of the other things that we've been doing throughout the year, as part of the IEP process, we're required to hold an annual review for each of the students who have an IEP. And um, Pat and I took advantage of that this year to really take a closer look at making sure that the students who have IEPs were receiving the appropriate level of services and support. So um, we made sure that they were enrolled in the classes that were appropriate, that students who needed transportation uh, were provided transportation. One of the other areas we looked at was extended school year, which is different from summer school. Extended school year is based on uh, anticipated regression of skills that a student would have, so that's one of the things we looked at. Um, <clears throat> then we created systems, protocols, and processes for school-based IEP meetings, and one of those things had it kind of reflects back up to the student support team. But one of the things that we did here was what we found was that we were finding teachers, case managers were kind of running around trying to figure out who can attend a meeting where and you know, how does a meeting go and what's supposed to take place at the meeting. So what we put in place was um, a system for doing that. The student support team, we provided protocols and processes that it's like an, it looks pretty much like an agenda with anticipated time frames so that when you, uh, you know, somebody goes into an IEP meeting, they have a guideline. So that's really helped to kind of um, get some systematic so that if a student goes to one building, one school, one student's at Ames, one's at Blythe, they're going to be provided the same opportunities for those meetings. So that's not just communicated to staff, it's communicated to the parents and all other um, people? Yes. Uh, well, what we put together was like a little ring <laughs> with the agenda on it. So one of the meetings would be a domain meeting, and that's when a student is up for an evaluation. So you look at all the different areas of the domain, all the domains you're going to evaluate. So it just itemizes it, kind of puts it in a, an alignment. Mm -hmm so that you don't miss something. It really makes it easier to make sure that you're doing what you need to do consistently and you're not missing something. So it just, it just makes it run a little bit smoother and that everybody has the same format and then it just becomes a, a practice, a way of doing business. Okay. And then um, we implemented, this has been a big help actually, we've implemented a data-driven st uh, student needs assessment to evaluate classroom and or individual parapro support. Um, one of the reasons why this is very helpful is because when you're looking at a student who might possibly need the assistance of an aide, you know, in the past it was easy to, easy to say, well, they need an aide and you just assign a parapro and you don't really take a look at where that student really requires the assistance. So sometimes students were being assigned parapros for periods of the day they didn't really need the help. And that doesn't really help promote independence. So this helps us take a look at, do they really, does the student really need a classroom assistant because they only need assistance in certain areas for certain things at certain times? And cert certainly some students need para support throughout the day. So this really, it's a, it's, um, it requires observations by administrators. There's three or four people that need to go and observe the um, behaviors or the areas of concern that are outlined by the staff. And then what it also does is it helps identify exactly where that student is going to require the assistance. So you might have a student who only needs assistant maybe for reading or you know, language arts, but they don't really need it for math. So another student might need it for math so we can share that pair of, if it's appropriate. I mean, you have to look at all of the schedules and that kind of thing, but it really helps identify um, where the student needs the assistance. And the other thing that it really helps with is it helps identify areas to work on helping that student become more independent, which is really a critical piece that we really never have done much in the past. You know, we look at, well, could they need help here? But the next step to that is how do we help that student become more independent in, in their functioning in school and their academics? So it's been very helpful in those areas. And then I think Another outcome that we took a look at this year was developing a continuum of services for early childhood education through eighth grade. And we looked at that from the blended preschool to the modified instructional program. Um, 
when we first presented to the board in the fall, one of the things we talked about was the fact that in terms of looking at least restrictive environment, we did not have a continuum of options. So as a result, we went back and we took a look at where were areas that we really were lacking in terms of being able to provide our services, provide services to our students as they needed them. As Mrs. King said, LRE is defined by what is necessary for individual children. So we were out of compliance in terms of having a continuum. And I think there was an impact in that we also then had more students placed out in therapeutic day placements. So we wanted to take a look at basically what we were doing on the home front first. So um, I've been before the board since then, and we talked about the development of the blended preschool. Okay, We came to the board, we received approval, because up until this point, our, the only option for our three to five year olds was a self-contained program. Consequently, um, what we have done this year is we put together a committee, we met, we identified what would be the best model, we implemented, um, we developed a model for a blended preschool, which will, three out of the four sections, will have typical peers along with students with disabilities. And then again, to provide that continuum, there will be one section that because of their extreme needs, the students may in fact need to be just with other students with disabilities. That has been approved. We've had a parent information night. Parents have begun registering um, their typical peers for the program and registration will remain open over this summer. We also looked at the fact that up until this point, there was not a primary or an upper level um, instructional program for students with more, my, uh, more dis disabilities, similar to those like learning disabilities, behavior disorders, some students that might be on the spectrum. And so what we've been able to do, and again with board approval, is we've developed a primary modified instructional program. Um, and we now we will split the class and we have an intermediate one. And without <coughs> the addition of, of staff, Hauser has been reconfigured. And so one of the teachers that are currently in place, we will be able to put that program option in at Hauser. So consequently, we will have a continuum of services at that, at that level. At, at, at Hauser or how would Primary K through? through <coughs> Brian, is it the blue one? What what for, here, it's on the gray side. button? No, it's, the, it's on the side. Oh. Thank you. <laughs> uh, can you just It will go, I, I'm sorry, no. just a minute, Mr. Broadway. <coughs> it will go primary through middle school. So there will be a level class at primary, There'll be one at intermediate, and there'll be one at the junior high as well. I don't well, fully understand what you're saying about this uh, progression and so forth. Could, could okay. you, could you? Sure. Elaborate? We talked about a continuum of services. Okay, so that's type of programming, <laughs> but it's also making sure that the service is available at each grade level. Okay. At this point, we were only servicing students basically fourth through sixth, gr fifth grade, um, third through fifth. Third, third so grade. consequently, if you had a student that was a first or a second grader that you had tried in terms of providing services in a more inclusive environment, but they weren't being successful and their needs were not being met, we didn't have an option in the district. So then we had to look to either LADSI mm -hmm. or outside placements, placements outside of LADSI. Now we have that continuum that will go primary, intermediate, and middle school. Did that always require an outplacement if, if we didn't provide it? If we didn't, yes. If we, we are legally required to provide services to meet the needs of individual okay. students. You always want to look to the neighborhood school, okay? You always want to look within your district because part of the idea of least restrictive is also looking at closest to home. But from there, if you cannot, you are still obligated to provide the service. So you need to look elsewhere until basically you can find a program that's going to meet the needs of those, those mm -hmm. children. 
So you said that we, before that, we're only servicing third through fifth? This year, this year, basically, the class has third through fifth in it. There wasn't an option at the middle school, and there wasn't an option for kindergarten, first, or second grade. The option was that outplacement. outplacement. Right. And this is for what, which students? These are students that require a modified instructional program so that they, they're they capable of learning with district curriculum. They need modifications need, made to it. They need adaptations made to it. And there's then, from there, there's a high degree of mainstreaming them back into the general ed. Okay. Right. Okay. This sounds like a huge step that we made this year on this. It, I mean, it's a positive step in positive the fact step, that yeah. legally we were totally out of compliance in terms of offering options for students. Okay. Right. Okay. Um, leadership and uh, leadership and team meeting buildings, district related service professionals. Basically, what has been occurring is that all buildings now, and, and that's what Ms. King was alluding to, hold weekly team meetings to discuss students either pending placement or currently enrolled. So the communication has improved within the buildings, okay? So that those team meetings are in place. What we also did was, um, I think most of you are aware of the fact that there was a special ed leadership team, and that used to meet on a monthly basis. We met with them, and Peggy and I used them both to get some feedback to um, in terms of policies and procedures that we were looking at. Once we had agreed on some of those procedures that we could put in place, such as what she was talking about for the IEP and the team meetings, they would be the ones going back to their buildings and, and basically spreading the word amongst the buildings, okay? Then our related service staff members didn't have any opportunities to communicate with each other in terms of like professionals. So we put in place a system of meeting with speech and language pathologists and social workers where they would come together on a monthly basis, and these were after school meetings, they would come together on a monthly basis and they would basically sometimes talk about individual cases, sometimes talk about what assessments do we have in place in the district, what assessments do we need to have, are there gaps in what we're providing, and again, to do some problem solving. Okay, so that gave, it was basically a professional networking amongst, because they serve on all their teams and they represent their profession, but I think we all know that we still need opportunities to talk amongst people that share our same expertise so that you continue to grow and learn from each other, okay? The next thing we did, and one of the things we promised we would do um, at the beginning of the year was we reevaluated the off-campus placements. That does tie in a little bit to what we did in terms of developing that continuum of services, but um, I think two of the biggest things we did was, was last fall in the therapeutic placements, not in the LADSI placements, therapeutic placements, we had 25 students. Next year we'll have 16. So nine students have basically we've moved out. And we anticipate that the number will not continue to increase because that is never our end goal, to send students that far away because of the fact that now we have more options within the district that we should be able to best serve students always starting with their home school. How, uh, how, how far away are we talking? I mean, what, what are we well, talking about? Well, it depends. We had right? students at Cove in Northbrook. We had students at Sonia Shankman and Hyde Park Day School in Hyde Park. Hyde Park. Um, Elam out in Palis, um, Acacia in LaGrange Highlands. Um, okay. That's all, the, that's all that's coming to mind at the moment. Right. Right. So yeah. Giant Steps. The student that was placed residentially uh, stayed actually correct. Can you define therapeutic placements? You didn't that how you, you just use that word? Correct. Um, it's the most restrictive placement in that it is totally a uh, basically a special day school. Mm -hmm. All the students that are there are um, are with like students. Okay, so that there are no typical ed 
there are no typical ed peers in an, in the setting, and their needs are of a very significant degree. Right. So that you know they need multiple. If it's if it's behavior, then there's there's um, an intensive counseling, psycho um, psychoanalytical. I am really losing my um, my verbiage here. Okay. Um, right. Some some are psychiatric. You know, there, there's multiple services that are not typically found in your general education. Building. And we will be continuing to serve the needs of those students outside of um, uh, the schools here in D96. Correct. Okay. Those that are in there. But, you know, that's a conversation we've had with Mrs. Shaw, too, and that I think both Peggy and I have taken a look that there's some that, having observed them for a year, we would like to begin the conversation that maybe they can come back, you know, the following So you think year. there are some, some potential to I, be able to serve some of those needs? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. There, there, there are certainly some that we would, we would, I think, take a look at. We had a conversation with Mr. Brockway the other day. There are some, however, whose needs are so significant that, for whatever reasons, may not move from those places. So I think the important thing to keep in mind is, for some students, that absolutely is the appropriate placement. And that's kind of where the judgment comes in from the IEP team and the, and the district when they meet. Because we were all involved with the annual review, with the evaluation process at those schools. Okay. Um, created a summer evaluation team to include district staff. Um, last year, there were a number of our students that did not have re-evaluations or evaluations during the course of the school year, so they were referred to LADSI for their evaluations. And so for those evaluations, there, there was a fee. And so this year, we knew that there was one student that was definitely moving back into the area and would basically require a re-evaluation. So we initiated the conversation about at least identifying staff members that would be interested in serving on an evaluation team as the need arose over the summer so that we didn't need to refer them to LADSI. The only exception being the early childhood students, the students that basically were required if they turn three by their third birthday, they have to be evaluated and, and programmed for. So students that have come up that will be turning three over the course of the summer LADSI, because they do, it's a special, highly specialized evaluation that they do, they will do our early childhood students. But any others we anticipate we will be able to handle in-house. Um, weekly co-plan, streamlined process during teacher planning times, reduced substitutes. Basically that occurred mostly at, at Hauser, that they tried to rearrange schedules so that gen ed teachers, special ed teachers on teams, their actual planning times were together so that they could have a co-plan meeting. One of those times would be a co-plan meeting during the week so they can talk about the students also without requiring substitutes and also that at a point in time if they needed to have an IEP, team, an IEP meeting, then all of those people were available and again it would reduce the substitutes. Okay. Brian, were you going to touch on that last one? The creative design development framework? Yes. Um, we, we have that on all of our, uh, all of our slides, um, as because LRE is one of our, our PD goals for okay. next year. Our so what? that's the framework that we shared earlier. Uh, least restrictive environment is one of our PD goals for next year. Oh, okay. Professional okay. development. So that just says that we're going to really focus on this next year. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, and thank you to the board and to Dr. Sharma Lewis. It's been a wonderful year. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you both. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you, thank thank you thank for you. Uh, all your hard work. Patty or um, or Bill here, um, or have they already made their? Uh, re Pardon me. 
agenda that there's a the Q&A section. Review, there's question and answer. I hope that's not going to happen. Uh, no. Well, I, there, I asked a few. There could be, I guess. So if, uh, was it, was is that the intent of the Q and A? Uh, well, means. I thought that. Oh, um, I'm sorry, Pat and Peggy. Yes. Um, no, no. We um, could we ask a few questions? Sure. Sure. Yeah. Oh, okay. You need to speak into a microphone. Oh, I was going to say we probably should. <laughs> oh. Okay. Okay. He said we're fine if we stay here. Oh. Okay. Can you hear us better, or yeah. would it be better if we come up yes. there? Yes, uh, the questions could be open to the. To yeah, the I'd like you if you could audience. please step up. Oh, if you don't sure. Mind. All right, um, Mary, do you have a question for? I, I, I have a question. Yes, yeah. um, and I'm. No longer oh, I'm sorry. We're speak. supposed to ask people to stand up to microphones. Thank you. <laughs> yes, yes. yes. Okay. That's the rule if you want to speak. Um, I'm Mary Judy. I live on Northwood Road. And um, as of last week, I no longer am a District 96 parent. However, I have years of experience um, as a District 96 parent since, 19, or since 2005. And um, I just... I wanted to thank you for the time that you spent with us. Um, and I, I work extensively with, with RAIN, the Riverside Area Inclusion Network. And um, nobody's more thrilled than the RAIN parents about the kids that are coming home finally. Um, there is, th there has been a lot of needs that were not being met. Um, and, and I know from personal experience that a reason that many kids were sent out was because um, the services were simply not in place within the district. The district came a long way between 2006, I think it was, when Dr. Polk came in um, to, to um, her resignation last year, but um, there was a lot of filling in that had to be done, which is why a lot of kids got sent out off campus. And we didn't want to see that happen. However, I do know that one of the reasons that they were sent off campus was to protect them um, because the services were not offered here. And so as you know, as, as special education professionals, those are very vulnerable kids. And if the teachers don't know how to teach them, it's a dangerous thing to have them in the schools. And so that's why that happens. But there's a flip side to that as well, and I'd like to know how you're going to address this or, or how Ms. Shaw is going to address this. Um, even our kids that come out of self-contained classrooms and, and are integrated back into a gen ed environment. Um, but certainly our kids that come from an off-campus placement and come back into an environment, the, the stigma associated with that is horrendous on these kids. Most of them never recover socially from that kind of stigma. Um, it's, it's not only a stigma within their peers, it's within the parent groups, and it's within the teachers. Okay, those kids are permanently identified. And it's a really difficult, we would love it to be a fluid environment, right? We, we'd love for the kids' needs are met, they grow, they move on. I mean, you know, all little kids do things that they'd like to have forgotten, right? Wouldn't we all? But that doesn't happen. And so my question is, what is designed into the program? And I am praying to God that you've got lots of professional development focused on this, um, for integrating <coughs> that fluidity, for teaching the teachers specifically how to help those kids socially reintegrate. Because whenever you're doing those kinds of changes in placement, if that doesn't get addressed, if the social component is not addressed, the after school supports so that they can be involved in things and everything, if that's not addressed, you might as well send them back off campus because, or send them back into the self-contained classroom because they're never going to be accepted by their peers and they're not going to be accepted by the teaching staff. Well, one of the, the nice things about having those opportunities is to have the team approach. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I have you know, found 
to be successful in those situations is to make sure that those services are provided to the student where the student learns. Mm -hmm. So that would include the social work, having those social skills development provided mm -hmm. into the classroom, mm -hmm. not, not a pull out, I'm going to teach you how to get along with your friend mm -hmm. and play a game and then shoo you on your way. Right. So, no, it's really very much a team of So, So am I hearing push in social work, particularly at the middle school level? Yes. Wonderful. Okay. Yes. Um, it, especially in, in the modified class, it mm -hmm. can be provided there. And, and that modified pro these modified programs are not just a place to house students. I, you know, it, it's not designed that way. It may have been in the past. We have to move forward. Yeah, right, right and look at how, how to best meet the needs, of, the needs of the students who really need that environment. For some kids, it might mean the whole day at the beginning. Mm -hmm. And you look for opportunities. This is where you're talking about the staff training yeah. and making mm -hmm. sure that the staff, not just the teacher in that classroom, but the entire building where that student is going to be participating as a student is open to that. And I mean, I, I've seen this work. I mean, I've, mm -hmm. I've experienced this before. And what I found works the best is when everybody becomes a community. And it's everybody's child. Yeah. It's not your child. It's right. It belongs to the school. This right. is part of our family, our school right. family. But we all know that the, some kids, least restrictive environment is, is, like I said earlier, least restrictive for each individual student. Mm -hmm. For some kids, that might be at the beginning when they come back from uh, another outside placement or wherever. So we have some kids moving into who have been in a similar type of situation, are supported enough so that they're when they're mainstreamed, they're confident enough to be successful there. Mm -hmm. It's not just well we think you know you're ready. We need to make sure that we provide that support and ease them into that so that they they become accepted. And I think the biggest, the most critical piece is to have those kids, all kids, everybody's children in that building, mm -hmm. be part of the, build, the school community. <coughs> and that includes the parents. You know, we like to get parents um, in to help. You know, there are many things, especially in a, in a special ed environment, as you know, mm -hmm. you know yep. that teachers could use help with. That could be cutting out things. It could be, you know, coming in and reading. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I had one father who didn't even have a child with autism who came to the autism, came actually to see his daughter work in the classroom sure. as a buddy. <laughs> and he ended up coming in once a week and volunteering. He raised money to put a special swing on the playground. Mm -hmm. And that was a result of the acceptance of those right. students as part of the whole building. And it takes time. It's not going to happen mm -hmm. the first day of school, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. We all know better than that. But it is a mindset. Mm -hmm. You know, it's an acceptance. Mm -hmm. So I think it really requires everybody to come together as a community mm -hmm. and, and support those kids. And some of the kids can be in there for a period of day. They, it'll be an opportunity for them to have a place to go. Some kids need to take tests in a quiet area. Some kids, especially kids who um, are on the autism spectrum, sometimes just need a break. They just need a little bit of a different environment, not necessarily different instruction, but they just need a place to go to have their sensory needs mm -hmm. met. And those services would be provided within that environment and not just a pull out. And I think, too, we're not talking about a wholesale, like all of a sudden the 25 students that are out there, we're moving them all back in the fall. We've worked with students over the course of this year that have been, we've met myself, the building administrator do an initial meeting at the day school, okay? We start to talk about, well, what is the student's strength area? Okay, the strength area is science. Then let's look at integration for one period. Let's try that, if that's something that's gonna work for that student. So those decisions are made on an individual basis, which is why when I said, Next year, there's a couple of students we would look at. We felt that this year, we were just getting to know the situation. Mm -hmm. The timing wasn't right. The students were maybe on the cusp, but it wouldn't be a good time to push. So let's relook at next year. Same thing with the student I have in one of the LADSI programs. You know, has a history, you know, basically of laying in an orphanage for three years and adopted here and is doing amazing in this program and the coordinator said to me not this year 
but we really think next year she's going to be able to come back. Mm -hmm. Because right now, you can imagine the anger in this little girl. Her behavior isn't under control, but her academic skills have amazingly, in two years, she's, she's a kindergarten age student, are at grade level. Sure. She's doing beginning reading. So it's those kinds of things. The issue is, it really is student by student. Mm -hmm. And, and I think in addition to that, you know, I mean, we all know that really the person who is the head of the class, the teacher in that program, mm -hmm. is really the advocate for those mm -hmm. kids. And, and has to be able to, to develop the trust of the other team and to work with them to make sure that, you know, well, maybe this, maybe this student can only come in for a specific activity, mm -hmm. but they need to know when that activity is and they need to make sure that they provide the supports for that student. So mm -hmm. that is a critical piece and it does require a lot of mm -hmm. trust building and a lot of training and a lot mm -hmm. of, again, acceptance. You know, it can be done and when it's done well, it works well. Right. So. Well, I think you hit on a key term there trust and yeah. that's mm -hmm. yeah. that <coughs> is what's <coughs> been probably mm -hmm. not just in special ed I think in a lot of areas in district 96 mm -hmm. trust mm -hmm. is what's been lacking mm -hmm. and and if we can or if Ms. Shaw can make that happen then yeah. you come a long long way yeah a long and, and, I, and I do think in all fairness to the students that are in these outplacements it's the right thing to do mm -hmm. you know I mean uh, we have a student at, here at Hauser that we were able to mainstream back for part of the day, but not the whole day because mm -hmm. he couldn't make it. Mm -hmm. Because he needed that environment, not necessarily sure. academics, but he needed he needed those sensory supports that just are not available this year. Yeah. So. Well, I hope he felt wanted. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, I, yes, I, he did well for the time he was here, but he just yeah. couldn't make it the whole day. Mm -hmm. And that was frustrating for us as a staff that we couldn't provide that for him because we couldn't, you know, it's, we don't have a magic bullet. So. Right. Right. But, you know, but we did look to see what kind of supports he needs so that when we're developing the program, we make sure that those things are in place. Mm -hmm. It's not just a place, it's an environment. Sure. So. Thank you. Okay. Thank so. you. And, um, Mary, if, Mary, if you live in the district and you're a parent, you're still a D96 parent. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, well, what's that um, I'm a, I'm a D96 uh, neighbor. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Um, Pat and Peggy, again, I want to thank you um, very much for, for, um, for, for assisting our district. Um, and we're very proud of the work that you did. Thank you very much. Thank you. For the opportunity. Thank you. It's wonderful being here. And I know I speak for everybody on the board, and I, I'm sure many people in the community that know your work. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Where are we? Next, um, financial. Um, well, uh, I don't. See any representatives still here from the Riverside Education Council? But I believe they have uh, spoken already. So, um, can I give you a uh, board liaison? Update? Pardon me. A board liaison update. Okay, thank you. Uh, just wanted to let you know that uh, Zach, um, Zach and I attended an EdRed meeting. Um, EdRed again is the uh, lobbying organization, trade trade organization for us. Uh, um, the suburb school districts. Um, at that meeting, there's a, a presentation about Senate Bill 16. It was mentioned here this evening with the PMA presentation about the impact and, and basically the politics around that. Um, it is something that it was, I thought it was a, a, a very helpful presentation to understand the financial, the, the potential financial impacts that this would have, um, especially on a district like, uh, uh, dis like our district. Something that I suggested that maybe we have at uh, a presentation at a finance meeting, obviously not the July <laughs> meeting because this, this seems a little packed, but um, but sometime in the fall, uh, the legislation didn't move forward. It pa it passed the Senate, but didn't pass. It uh, didn't get to the into the House. But it, it we were told, um, just like we heard here, that this is the direction of this of Springfield, this redistribution of revenue. And district and school districts that have a lot of local resources in their terms um, 
meaning property tax values, affluent, you know, deemed affluent districts will get the brunt of this. So it's something that I think we need to really become educated on and be prepared for financially. Because you can't just, you know, all of a sudden you lose $800,000 in revenue that you can just magically find some place. It has to be done over time. Otherwise, it's too much, too much impact to the taxpayers. All right. One of the things um, I did receive uh, some financial reports. Um, I think Rachel got some things from uh, some of the folks at RB, uh, the kind of things um, that they're getting. And I don't have a position on a lot of it, but I did notice that their financial um, um, business manager did uh, put a blurb uh, on that report on the impact of SB 16 to um, RB, I guess he basically g gave the dollar amount and um, yeah. Uh, and, the, and so the ISB was it the ISB? Yeah, they did a whole analysis of all, all school districts, all so I'm sure he used that as the basis of his number. All so right. we were we our number was seven hundred and eighty nine thousand. Yeah. Seven hundred eighty nine thousand. Okay. So that's so revenue loss. And that's Re just oh, revenue that's loss. Just the that's not both pieces. That's just the one. That's just that's the, just the general state aid. Right. 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 But I anyway, it just seemed very timely that I saw that today. And yeah, uh, well, that's what we tried to shoot out from you know, Ed Red had sent information, mm -hmm. so that's what we sent out. And, and Zach provided that information to us through the email to broadcast to our to the board members. All right, um, thank you. Next, uh, financial information items do we have any uh, questions on invoice and spending, um, financial statements, or current expenditures? Uh, the response to Lisa's email. So, no questions. Can you? Um, oh, I, my question was: I just wanted to understand on the anticipated expense report what. Not going to say it right. Time, Panny. Tiffany. <laughs> 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 ah, yes. Boom, 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 boom. I I didn't know what that was, and I wanted to know what that was. So maybe you should give a quick explanation, like you gave in the email. Or, I'll take care of it. Uh, or somebody yeah. did. Uh, I will. Okay. Uh, Tiffany is a uh, it's a consulting firm uh, that specializes in uh, networking and internet uh, internet working and network design. Um, they would be coming in to do an assessment of our network and provide us a, a detailed di diagram, essentially a blueprint of, of our network as it exists because we don't have one uh, cur currently. From that blueprint, and, and you really have to liken it to if we're, uh, well the district recently underwent a huge construction project. Uh, you need those blueprints to, to, to design what, to build out for the future. So that provides us a lot of information moving forward. Uh, having, uh, uh, just as you would have a, uh, a um, an architect design for uh, improvements in your school, you need a networking architect to design for, uh, uh, for, for network infrastructure um, uh, moving forward. Uh, I know sometimes with, with technology, we, we try to think that we can do everything in-house, but you know, it would be the equivalent of having you know an internal maintenance person or head of maintenance do that level of it's very specialized uh, highly trained type work just as you would for an architect to to, to construct out for uh, or to make that plan that map for uh, any type of construction project that we have in the district um so this is a consultant um and i'm sorry what was the cost uh of this just answer? under ten thousand dollars and has that work already been done, or no? No, it is not. All right. Actually, um, we have a, a, a kickoff meeting scheduled for tomorrow afternoon. With whom? With Tempin. Okay. And um, will there be a contract uh, to describe what the scope of their work the, is? The, the scope of work is. Uh, I have that scope of work fully detailed and can provide that to you if it hasn't already been. All right. Um, yeah, I've actually had uh, some questions on this from the people who are not here today, and they're very interested in, in that information. And so um, I don't know if it's uh, we're the best place to put that document. Uh, it was attached to the uh, yeah, it was to Lisa's it's, questions. <coughs> okay. Yeah, the, I mean, in order for us to, to move forward, and we're getting at the point, especially if we're, we're going to try to get some uh, uh, 
the, the redesign of our network completed for the start of school, uh, that this type of work has, this foundational work has to begin. So from that, we can create the actual plan of what the redesign looks and what work has to be done. Uh, currently, we don't have a map essentially of our, uh, it's, it's, it's a network schematic essentially, it's a blueprint, a highly technical blueprint at that. Mm -hmm. And um, they're going to start with the current state or we don't really? Yes, yeah, so we have to identify the state it's in, and not only the state, but again the design. Uh, so that from that, from given that design, then we can, can begin to plan based on where we're at and where we want to be. Now how can we make sure that as we change the network that uh, devices and uh, systems that are talking to each other continue to talk because there are multiple, we, we might think of it as one network within the, the district, but it's actually running on multiple networks and systems are talking to each other on multiple networks. We have uh, networks at each building, we have phone networks, uh, we have security networks, uh, uh, and, and if we're gonna make changes, we don't wanna have any breaks within those networks and, and for instance, not have a security system talking to centralized systems uh, when, when changes are made. So we, we want to make sure we have a full map of, of the district's network before we start <laughs> making changes to it. Will, will the scope of their work, I'm sorry I haven't had a chance to read it yet, include um, also mapping for the future or are we just doing right at the moment the current state? At the moment, they, it does at the moment with some recommendations for the future. Okay. And, 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 it, and there are several deliverables that are outlined within uh, the, the scope of the work that will be provided to the district that we'll always have. And then it's up to us to make sure that as we make changes to the network, that we're, that we're updating that information so that it's always accurate and up to date. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. And um, I would ask that, that um, attachment be put in board book under maybe this section of the just so I know where to refer to it in the future. It's and I think going forward, <coughs> procedures that we were identified today, as we start putting in future or current expenditures, we'll just add those proposals in there with uh, the documents that Zach already provides. You know, so as you see current and anticipated expenditures, we'll see proposals, we'll attach those along with it. It's a great idea. The, the assessment and the work being done will take several weeks to complete, but once it is complete, uh, I will have items to, to show you what, you know, what was complete, the work that was actually completed, what we have in our possession, uh, and then those recommendations moving forward. And mm -hmm. it's not only our, uh, it, it's, it's our network inf infrastructure, including uh, wire, our, an assessment of our wireless network as well, which is, again, another network that operates uh, w within our entire network. So, so it's every network we have, uh, pretty yes. much. <laughs> it, it, exactly. So we don't have one, we have many. And this one been something expected from our, within our capital improvements, that this would have been a product that would have come out? I mean, that, to know, because we didn't lay down the wires when they created all the, put down the new wires. Yeah, but this isn't right? just wires. This is <clears throat> hardware, and the Har capital improvement project did not dictate hardware. Yeah, and, Har and, and actually, to that point, they, um, Thank you. they did a very nice job of documenting how the actual fit the physical connections uh -huh. uh, within within the building uh, and how they pass back to the different uh, main and intermediate distribution facilities. Okay, so that's it. I right. had uh, when we were getting a quote on the assessment for this work, the quote to, to get it done, uh, received a lot of uh, comments of they've never seen more pristine and beautiful uh, cabinets back there. So they've done it, and with the documentation all laid out. Okay, okay. And again, now it's a matter of maintaining that documentation. And this is just another level of documentation that provides us information moving forward. Okay. Okay. Who, yeah, whose work would that have been, that pristine uh, work? Uh, that I, would, I would think whenever the improvements were done to run the wire and cable line. It and was they, uh, and architects they would, and the contractor who did yeah. that work. And that's all specified within within that scope of work of what they were to be uh, what they were to complete. That would have been outlined, and, and, and again, even I've never seen you know, the level of detail of information that's provided on the actual uh, um, each cable where it's run from and where it goes to. Very detailed. But now um, we're looking at okay, what devices are communicating through right. all those wires, and how are they talking to each other? 
uh, and within uh, networks, net network devices have addresses, IP address, internet protocol addresses. So it's what is the addressing on the devices, what um, networks are they communicating on, and if we move them, what has to happen, what changes have to happen to if we move that equipment. Because ultimately, in order to, to save on resources, we're looking to, to bring more equipment, more, to centralize more equipment here and, and have that, uh, more equipment more centrally managed to, to eliminate the need to necessarily go on site to physically um, uh, work on or configure a device and have that information really travel then over the network to the other schools from a central location. The end work product, is that a physical document, a physical you know, piece of document, yeah, or is it electronic? Or, it's and I'm wondering it, if we'll, we, if we'll we change... We'll get it in an editable form, but, okay. but essentially it will look like... It looks like a blueprint. It's, a, it's, a, it's like a network schematic. It okay. just shows all the devices, addressing schemes, how they're talking to one another. Uh, but from this, we can then make changes and then update it based on those changes. Okay, so we don't have to have someone come in and do it all over again no. once we no. made changes. Pro provided, okay, good. We, provided we update this. Yes. And, and that's going to be critical <laughs> as well. Because then you have, um, you've wasted your investment. If right. you, exactly. So good. if this did exist at one time, anywhere, it, I haven't been able to find it and it probably wasn't updated to reflect what the network looks like right now. Yeah. Well, I'm guessing that, yeah, when they, we did the capital improvement projects, we did take out all the equipment but we put it back in some was old equipment. We bought new equipment where we needed it, and probably hodgepodge pieced it together. It, you know, yeah. and I'm no, and I guarantee you, nobody had time to write everything down just <laughs> well, in the most detailed way and, and because they had, you know, two days to get these schools or even we're, less. We're hearing differently. We're getting some compliments. Uh, no, no, I mean, I'm. I'm I mean, the one low on the lowest level piece of it, but the higher level pieces of hardware, I think we have some huge gaps. And, and that work that where hear. we have the high level of documentation was done by contracted services. Yeah. Uh, as we talk more about needs, you know, and, and you talk about doing things in a hodgepodge manner, it's documentation. Time has to be allotted for documentation and it is it is a time we had process. to get these projects done in the summer yeah, oh, no, get the schools open I, believe me, I, if we I, didn't I, get the schools open none of us would be here we'd have been shot so <laughs> uh, yeah all right well we're here <laughs> Glad. all right um, all right thank you very much Not that was a, that was a good good explanation um, uh, next um, motions for um, Financial payable items. Um, where are these motion sheets? Here? Keep moving things around here. Oh, action sheets. Here we go. May I have a motion um, uh, for payment uh, for, for uh, approve uh, the payment list of general invoices, Schedule A seven four six. Randy Brockway? Uh, yes. Lisa Gaynor? Uh, David Kadama? Aye. Arthur Perry? Aye. Mary Rose Mangia? Aye. All right, the motion's passed. Mm -hmm. um, next, uh, the um, a motion for the resolution of the prevailing wa uh, rate of wages effective June 1, 2014. Um, does anybody need an explanation of what that is? Um, well, I move that we approve it, and then we can discuss, I guess. All right, we can. Um, anyway. Um, second. 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 Well, um, so approve the prevailing rate of wages as enacted by state. Why don't you let me read? Um, I would just uh, like a motion that um, that we approve uh, that the Board of Education approve the resolution for the prevailing rate of wages as enacted by the State of Illinois as outlined in Exhibit A, uh, Table Cook County prevailing wage for June 2014. So moved. Second. Randy Brockway. Aye. Lisa Gaynor. Aye. Arthur Perry. Aye. David Kadama. Aye. Mary Rose Mangius. Aye. Thank you. Uh, 
I actually called the attorney to find out if I actually had to read these resolutions. I do not. <laughs> <laughs> so that probably uh, I'll make our meeting go so much faster. Faster. All right. Um, next is the designation of holidays for the 2014 2015 school year, and these apply to the 52 week staff members. Um, so I uh, would like uh, a motion that the Board of Education approve the designation of holidays uh, 2014 to 2015 for the 52 week staff members. Um, What's uh, the April 3rd date? Is that a reflection of Good Friday? Good Friday? That's Good Friday. Correct. It's just called a non attendance right. day? Yes. Oh, it's not attendance day. Okay. I guess the one, the one holiday on this list that would affect these uh, employees would be uh, the 4th of July, right? That's pretty much it. Okay. No, it impacts all of them, all those holidays. They're not attendance days. No, no, I understand. I was just saying that they would be pretty much identical to the... School calendar? To the school calendar except for the 4th of July, right? And winter break. Uh, okay. All right, um, may I have a motion uh, that the Board of Ed approve uh, the designation of holidays 2014 to 2015 for the 52 week staff members? So moved. Second. Juanita? Okay. Arthur Perry? Aye. Randy Brockwood? Aye. Lisa Gaynor? Aye. David Kadama? Aye. Mary Rose Mangia? Aye. Okay. Motion passed. Next, uh, uh, I'd like a motion that the Board of Education approve the application for the building permit for the Hauser School Roof Replacement Project Number uh, 14006 as presented. And uh, ex before we vote on that, can uh, Zach, can you update us on the project and also the 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 um, the bids. We received uh, a the lowest bidder, which came in at uh, approximately one hundred and seventeen thousand. Uh, the project will start uh, mid July. Should go for two to two and a half weeks, and uh, should be completed before the start of uh, the school year. And and also share the the estimated budget and what we. Oh, the estimated budget from uh, concept three was. Uh, I believe it was 175000 and it came in at, uh, we had a really good bid at 117000 How many yeah. other bids did we get? There were a total of, I believe, I want to say six or six maybe? Five are listed on the Oh, five, five then, I'm sorry, five. Yes, yeah, listed here. And this contractor five. is someone we've worked with before, right? Yeah, they've done all of our, a lot of our roofs. What's Ridge the name Worth. of the, the Ridge Worth. Ridge, 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 Ridge Way or Ridge Worth. Ridge Worth. Ridge Worth. Ridge Worth. Ridge Worth. They've done they've done work for our district in the past. Wow, the high bid was two hundred and seventy five thousand. Sometimes they, throw they it just throw it up. They, they don't want it because they don't want it. And, you know, if we want it, then they're going to make it on the premium. Okay. Nice. All right, and then um, uh, on Thursday we will be meeting again. Uh, to basically approve the bid so that we can begin the work. So um, so this is just for the application. This the is all we're voting on right now. So, um, all right. Um, I guess, Juanita, we can well, take the... We you take, have a motion, a motion right? No, we didn't get that motion yet. No. All right. Um, again, I just uh, asked for a motion to, uh, that the Board of Education approve the application for the building permit for the Hauser School Roof Replacement Project Number 14006. So moved. Second. Okay. David Kadama? Aye. Randy Brockway? Aye. Lisa Gaynor? Aye. Arthur Perry? Aye. Mary Rose Mandia? Aye. Motion passed. The motion passes. Uh, now another resolution uh, for the approval to establish a date of public hearing and determine dates for fiscal year 2014-2015. Uh, 
I have a motion that the Board of Education approve the resolution to establish a date of public hearing and determining dates for fiscal year 2014-2015 as presented. That date is September 16th, 2014. So moved. Second. Randy Brockway? Aye. Arthur Perry? Aye. David Kadama? Aye. Lisa Gaynor? Aye. Mary Rose Mandia? Aye. Motion passed. Uh, next. New business. Um, Don, would you... Um, is this the time maybe we want to start asking Don to make his presentation on? Um, sure. Did you want to approve? Yeah, that's fine. Do you want to take fine. care of this one? This Do you want to just approve the IGA? IGA. Well, but this is um, this it's a discussion item, so we can't. Uh, it's, it's not an, it's not a voting item. So, can you tell us a little bit about the Regional Safe Schools Program? Okay, sure. Um, it is an annual contract that we do with West Forty which is um, the districts in our consortium. And so if a student is um, deemed you know, unsafe, maybe due to suspension, discipline reasons, truancy, they have an alternate um, safe school to attend. So we have to pay mm -hmm. into the IGA in our annual amount. I'm just gonna pull that up. Um, it's listed in that agreement um, as part of the IGA. I'm sorry, I just can't find it right now. Keep scrolling down. It's on page two. I think I have it here. So is it is it sort of like a LADSI arrangement? Uh, Similar. A, a cooperative? Similar. Exactly. And so it's all just dealing with certain students that require discipline? Um, an alternate setting. And not necessarily discipline. So, right. An alternate right. setting if they're, you know, maybe suspended or expelled. Where would they go? You know, as an oh, it is, so it is associated with discipline, but they're not getting disciplinary services in these schools. It's an alternate safe school setting. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the price is eighteen hundred dollars for um, the school year. Is that cover t the actual tuition of a specific student, or is that the fee to be in the cooperative? That's the fee in the cooperative. All right. Um, and I guess we will add this to our voting agenda next month. Mm -hmm. Um, would, would there, well, we, we can't, I was going to say we could add it to Thursdays, but we didn't, it's too late. It's too late now. Yeah. All right. All right. Um, all righty. Um, all right. Next. Um, uh, Don. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, while that he's setting up, can I just quickly, um, uh, I don't know. We have to have a lot of discussion, but I would like to bring up as new business the possibility of the superintendent or a designee to be um, possibly, you know, participating or working with the high school on the parking lot project. And the other thank, things. thank you. It's here on my notes to bring it up, so I'm glad you did. Um, what what would her, their participation look like? Or I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, obviously it would be the availability of somebody, but there are going to be some public meetings. Um, obviously, if there's an opportunity for um, where the, the District 2A board or administration is reaching out, like I know you went to uh, walk the, the property um, a couple weeks ago, things like that, I would just like to give direction, you know, as a board to participate at that. I'm not saying right now that you, we're saying we're going to do exactly this and this and this, but as, as available, you know. I think it's a good idea. I think it'd be just make sure that we don't miss any meetings. Yeah. That we always have somebody at a meeting to come back to report to us. I, I think so. The first thing I would like to do is, um, I don't know if, if, District 208 has their schedule pre-planned of when they plan to be 
discussing this either at board meetings or public hearings but do we have that do we know that or, or I don't know all the dates I know that next week next Thursday next on the 24th it's on the 24th is that a regular board meeting or a special it's, it's, it's the same same setup as you guys have it's a board votes but the, at the last meeting to a regular meeting um, they announced that it's going to be specific to the point okay Okay. So I don't it, know if anybody is available. Is, do you, excuse me. Do you know if this is the will be the only agenda item, uh, or is it just a, an agenda item part of a full meeting? To look at the agenda, it's uh, classified under what is it, the emergency, the, the safety, forget the next life safety. Life safety because the parking lot issue falls within the life safety. Um, what sure. that money that's budgeted for that? Um, so, but at the last meeting last Tuesday. I believe it was, um, it was made pretty clear that it's going to be focused on the parking lot, the tennis court issue. All right. Um, Bhavna, then uh, can we direct um, uh, maybe uh, Bhavna to just maybe keep us abreast of the schedule on, um, and keep the board abreast and, to, and make sure that we actually uh, have somebody who um, attends each and every meeting yeah. and I know that the community would like uh, you know I saw a lot of the emails today would like a uh, member of the administration to go to some of these meetings I don't know if that's possible but is anybody planning to go uh, I did I asked, I asked Zach to attend since I'll be on vacation next week mm -hmm. okay then we'll see oh, well, great I'm, all right I'm, and thank you very much thank you I appreciate it uh, all right. Um. So I guess the key would be to communicate back to the board uh, periodically what's going on at these meetings, what the discussion is, what plans and are being made. That and also recommend how, you know, how we should um, best participate as a district. Um, you know, outside, I mean, we want to monitor them, but how we can be influential, uh, if we can. I don't know what, you know, I guess we'd have to go to a few hearings to uh, figure that out. But yeah, it's very unclear how we can be influential. I think that's important to note, but I just want to make sure, I want to do our best to we're, keep on top of it. We're a neighbor within yeah, 20 feet of uh, their property line, so we have... A right and an obligation and a duty to, to. Uh, well, it's right next door to our, yeah. our school. It's right there. Yeah. So I, I think, it, yeah, we should at least try, try to be aware. Um. All right, Don. Thank you. This. Wanted to uh, give a, an update uh, on the technology staffing, and hopefully I'll get through it before I have to change the date at the bottom. <laughs> no. We hope so too. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, the uh, uh, as as with any of the initiatives or recommendations, what I'm what I'm using to to guide those are the uh, guiding <laughs> principles within the district, which is ensuring technology infrastructure supports 21st century teaching and learning, and uh, develop district-wide instructional technology guidelines to optimize rigorous and relevant learning experiences. Um, in looking at determining what would uh, appropriate staffing levels be for a uh, school district this size with the number of devices it has, there's a variety of metrics that, that you can, can use. Uh, an, an older one is uh, called Project Athena that was developed by MIT and IBM. And essentially, they developed a calculation that took into effect the number of workstations, number of users, clusters, or uh, uh, or buildings or work groups that you have. Um, also, the number of applications uh, that, that you have um, and, and operating systems that you support and licenses uh, that you manage. <coughs> uh, plugging in the uh, district's information using only the work, number of workstations we have and not factoring in that uh, we have uh, 100, uh, 1,245 uh, iPods, iPads, the Apple TV. So this is just, this is just uh, this is just actual desktops and laptops. 
not factoring in those, using that, that staffing formula, we come up with about a department that would be about 7.36 or 7.5 uh, FTE uh, based on Project Athena. <clears throat> um, Gartner Inc., uh, very well known for technology research. They have, uh, they developed a, uh, uh, a formula by which uh, they looked at IT full-time employees as a percentage of the total workforce. Uh, but then they also broke it down by, uh, by industry. So you could see that based on this information, 11.9% uh, uh, was in the insurance and, and banking industry and uh, or the insurance industry and the banking and financial had 9.4 percent respectively so in those industries you're going to have higher levels uh, they did have education listed which was about at about 4.8 percent <clears throat> based on this if we use that formula with our FTE count being at approximately 200 as, as a district <clears throat> based on that um, we'd be looking at uh, a total of 9.6 FTEs for District 96 for staffing. <clears throat> what was that number again? Uh, 9.6 okay. or 9.5 people, essentially. <clears throat> so again, just looking at what metrics are out there and how we can compare ourselves to that. <clears throat> what I also looked at, what I started to do, is connect with other technology directors and other school districts that have one-to-one -one programs. Um, so, uh, one district that uh, I spoke with the, the tech director there is Downers Grove School District 58. They have an enrollment of uh, 51, uh, roughly 5,100 students. Give some information about uh, their the, the demographics, or I should say, some, some basic information uh, about the, the district. But then also revenue sources. As far as the devices, uh, they have 2,500 MacBooks. Uh, but with the thing about this, I'd, I'd say the um, one thing to take into account, the one-to-one -one program that they do have are iPads. They're not laptops. Very different devices when you talk to managing them and, not, and then also taking care of them in an environment where fifth through eighth graders are taking the devices home. Something happens to an iPad, if you have a spare, you can get them up and running in, in a matter of, of minutes where it could be hours to get a laptop uh, up and running and, and redeploy. Does this district have a take-home policy? Yes, they do. Okay. Yeah. But only on the iPads. Oh yeah, okay. that, the the MacBooks that they have are just in shared carts. Got it. Okay. So they never they never yeah. leave the uh, premise. <clears throat> and further looking at Downers Grove, of their staffing, this is what their staffing looks like. Uh, they have a director of innovation, uh, innovative technology and learning, Senator Doss, who also covers both sides of the house, net, not not, not network and operations and also the uh, instructional tech. They have a network manager, they have a level two technician, two level one technicians, four tech instructional technology coaches, a secretary, two software technicians, uh, coordinator for the information systems, data assistant, website administrator. <clears throat> Based on just looking at the total number of teachers they have in the district, I couldn't get an actual FTE count, and that I will come back with to actually look at what their FTE count is. Um, based on that, and uh, looking at and the information that I have compared to us using the um, Illinois Repart Card, uh, if we were to do a comparative using these metrics, it would equate to about five, five and a half technology department staff uh, mm -hmm. for our, for our uh, district. As far as the recommendations in staffing um, <clears throat> for w w what, what I feel is needed here and to support this environment, uh, immediate needs are a technology services manager. So this would be your network administrator, network administrator, your network manager. Um, also, um, kind of that that level level two and level three type support uh, to, to to manage uh, to just just basic networking, general network operations, um, and then a computer help de desk technician that is a tier uh, tier two support. Uh, help desk is a um, is, is, is a critical function uh, of an organization because uh, statistically uh, most of the requests that you get in are, are typically level one requests and then they estimate that about 58 percent of the calls or emails that come into a help desk uh, area are level one requests and they can be handled at that level and what's <coughs> an example of a level one request um, <clears throat> I uh, let, let's see a level one request would be anything that the individual who's answering the phone uh, can can resolve that issue over the phone 
or through an email with some simple steps. It, it typically involves user ear or a simple connectivity issue of some kind. Uh, or a, some type of direction to say, okay, this is how you can resolve that issue. Um, what can also be classified, there's, there's typically two types of, um, uh, of requests that can come in. Incidents, incidents would be something has failed, something is broken, something's not connected. Um, other things that can come in are requests. Oh, I need this piece of software. Oh, I need to learn how to, I need to, somebody to show me how to do this. And, and we do have to really start to break those down uh, once we gather information, once we have a help desk ticketing system, which will be critical, uh, because then you can start breaking it down. Requests, requests uh, are oftentimes can be handled through professional development, um, but then obviously if they're requesting new resources, how are, how are we handling those requests and who's approving those requests as well? All right, so in a, all right, um, thank you. Mm -hmm. In a school, we would could expect those coming from a from a classroom? That, that would be from team. Those would be all, staff would be the ones utilizing the help desk system. Yes. So it would be staff and <clears throat> could even be during the course of teaching, uh, in the course of instructing, or in the course of setting up or preparing their work? This would be at any time in which they ran into a technical issue where they either, where they sent in an email, and that's, that's going to be a cultural shift when we get a ticketing system because they will need to email the help, help desk area. And then uh, we're fortunate that we have, uh, with having a phone in every classroom, with having the ability to, uh, well now to, to, to do some level of remoting into systems so that we don't have to send a technician out to, 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 to go on site, which I think was past practice, where it's more efficient to stay in one spot and only go out to a site where you absolutely need to actually do a physical repair or something. And as the staff you're recommending going to be an on-site <coughs> person who's here? Yes, who's yes. Here those individuals would, would each be at FTE. The, the timing of it, what's the, the first hire, which I feel is an immediate need, is that technology services manager. Then, once they've come on board to be involved in the process of hiring the technician as well. Uh, and anytime you start adding staff, you can't add, a, it's difficult to add a lot of staff at, at one time uh, because of the, the learning curve. There's a learning curve to every, um, every environment, every, te every tech environment that you walk into. Uh, you know, every system basically that I've walked into in, in this district is different from a system that I've managed before. It's, they're similar, but there's always that learning curve. And, and to have two people, two people on at the same time it's, it, it's difficult to, to have everybody going through that process at once. Companies uh, often have their help desk <clears throat> remote somewhere. They contract it out to mm -hmm. some consultant. Um, so we're talking about the help desk component and, and a technician <clears throat> component. And they're also the technician too. That person would also be performing the majority of the brake fix. Just that, that in influx of brake fix items or you know, hard disk failures, cracked screens, uh, just that the day-to-day -day things that happen, uh, you know, stuff, uh, something gets stuck in a CD drive, and those types of things. So we, you, you, you would expect one person then for the help desk technician role. Exactly. <clears throat> and then if, if there is an issue with a device that needs to get escalated, they can escalate it to that technology service manager. And the, is the technology service manager a role that's currently being performed by Net 56? Um, <clears throat> partially. All right, and would the hiring of this technology service manager replace, uh, uh, eliminate the need for the person at Net 56? Yes. Yeah. Yes, that, that, okay. Yeah, and, and the, the timing of bringing a new person in and then weaning Net56 off, that's also been part of the, uh, the recommended plan of, of keeping with the higher level person with Net56 until I believe it was October 1 or September 1, and then uh, just keeping the lower level on after we bring in uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the tier two, the technician help desk person, uh, to then have them gradually come into the environment and then wean off of, of them mm -hmm. on that, that role as well. Uh, but from uh, other support services, Net56 is currently providing all our power school support. One thing that wasn't done, there was no, there wasn't a high level of cross training so that there was two people who knew, who knew, how, who knew how to perform the same functions. Consequently, we're a little bit behind the eight ball with our 
ability to support our student information system. Not that we can't build capacity with existing staff, but that takes time. And, mm -hmm. and having that level of go-to support in the event that the internal people cannot perform the functions that need to get, get completed. Currently, Net56 is, 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 is actually generating all of our state-mandated reports for us. That is something that there needs to be further training on for staff here so we could support it internally. We should be able to support that application internally, but when situations do arise, you, need, you, you don't, don't necessarily have that like level three expert. You need to be able to have that to go, to be able to go to them. We usually can get that type of support directly from the vendor, from Pearson, that can have that high level. We should be able to handle 90% you know, of, of, of the uh, requirements for power school internally if we can get people trained up, which I think we can. So do you have a before and after exhibit here? Uh, before, this is what it is actually a current, and then with all the services that are being provided with technology, with Net56 and everything, and the costs associated with, and then your recommendation, and what new, what positions would take over those services and that I think that there is some of that information that you're looking for, which we, which we will cover later in, in closed session. Uh, but actual detail of what uh, Net56 is providing now versus what you know, we can talk about that. I can detail that out for you. Okay. Currently, but I would like to see it. On definitely. The, on the comparison. And definitely. also an org chart. Can we see an org chart of what? I mean, isn't that what you're kind of trying proposing here? Yes. What your org right chart? Now, yes, correct. That, and, and with this, it's the, the org chart, the, the long term org chart really only consists of the top two positions. Right. The, the, third, the third item is a, a level of support that's needed until we can get trained. Uh, the fourth item is regarding information security. <clears throat> and and what, I, what I do want to stress, as with the, uh, uh, the, the network assessment that Tiffany is providing, <clears throat> there will always be a need to, um, to, to seek third-party consultants to do that high-level technical stuff. There will always be, because we cannot... We do not have the ability to staff those types of individuals to have them, but you want to access them just as when the roof is being done in Hauser, you're contracting that out. The other impact, one of the other reasons you need to do that is just as, as ma building maintenance and grounds, <clears throat> they support day-to-day -day operations. And when big projects come along, if you require them to do the, those big projects, then they aren't doing the day-to-day -day operations. There is a day-to-day -day operations function of the technology staff. The more pro it's all about capacity. The more work you throw on, on the staff, then everything else slows down. That's why we need to establish priorities when we do have projects come in, and we need to be realistic about how long they actually will take. If they are high priority and we do not have the capacity to support them internally, then we go out to third parties to say, can you implement this for us? And, and those situations will arise depending on the, um, the priority of the need and our ability to support ourselves uh, uh, internally to have our own capacity. Uh, but the information security uh, support is an, an item that, again, because we do, there is no information security expert on staff, that is something that we will seek out. I, I think we all have seen in the news the vulnerabilities of organizations, organizations much, much bigger than ours, uh, that have had uh, security breaches and loss of information. Uh, and we, we obviously do carry personal identif uh, personally identifiable information for not only staff, but students, to have a full understanding of who has access to that information. When that information is, is downloaded, if, if, if people are able to save so, uh, uh, social security numbers to a uh, local draw, to, to a local computer, if that computer is lost, if it's on a uh, mobile device, these are the types of things that, that need to be um, evaluated and staff also will need to be trained on what is best practice when handling that type of information. I had a question about instructional technologists yes. not covered on your <clears throat> slide. So where, where does that fit? This has been my main focus as right now because this is the highest need. Okay. And, and right now, um, what we really need to do is make sure that we have the an infrastructure in place that truly allows us to evaluate 
that instructional tech. And I'm really not going to get to evaluate that really in, until kids are back in the classroom and teachers are out there using the equipment and I can actually get a better understanding of how they're utilizing it, look at their instructional practices. Pedagogy is a huge component. We have these great resources, but are we leveraging them? Are we, uh, are we using them to, to truly engage students in learning? I can't make that judgment right now. But at that time, once we can gather information over uh, at the beginning of the school year, we can start to come back with some, uh, some observations and get some feedback on that. Um, in the uh, Technology Steering Committee uh, meeting uh, last month, I think it was last month, or yeah, I think it was the end of May, <coughs> this track of time goes so fast. Um, <coughs> one of the things that I touched on is a need, uh, is a means, a way to measure our success. And I think when the program, when the one-to-one -one program was put into place, with the goals being that our students will obtain 21st century goals, uh, well, was there any was there any baseline established from which, and and that's and that's what I'm working with right now. So what I want to do is, even though it's five years into the program, let's establish that 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 that, that baseline, and then if nothing else, we can identify programmatic gaps. We can, we can identify where our students' straight strengths are relative to the ISTE net standard, which is the, are the, the true technology standards that are out there right now until Common Core really develops theirs. But there are, <clears throat> there, there are ways to do that through, through various assessment products that will measure that. And, and it will tell us where they are relative to those, those standards, but it will also help us to identify gaps, because once we identify gaps, we can, we can then uh, uh, PD to those gaps or augment the uh, curriculum to, to address those gaps and, uh, and really it, it, it provides opportunities to really identify uh, where do we just need to beef up uh, resources and instruction. Okay. So, sorry. Just, okay. to, just to clarify though, for the time <coughs> being when school opens in August or when everybody comes back in August, our two current instructional uh, tech people will be doing what they've been doing. Yeah, I, I, I think that's, I, I think as far as evaluating um, those, those positions, I think we can begin to do some of that in, in the near term and have some discussions about that, but our staffing levels in that area definitely need to stay where they're at. Okay. One thing that we discussed a few months ago was uh, building security. You know, we, we've got uh, monitors and different things and on some doors. And mm -hmm. We have five different buildings. Um, the idea at the time was, well, let's let's wait and do a comprehensive. Um, I would just like to to put in a word for that now, that we <coughs> that we uh, provide uh, services, you know, for the the, the type of uh, building and school security that we that we're hearing about that it's needed around the country. Well, and, and I think there, there's a couple of levels of security. As far as the security system and access control and cameras, that's something that I've already been approached by two vendors that would like to come in and do free assessments. I think there's a need to consolidate, and, and, and they'll come in and, and just so that we're not running on multiple systems. And again, those are systems that if we consolidate, that plays into uh, the, the, the networking and, and how those systems talk to each other. I think what, what you're also talking about who actually is allowed in the building, and, and what are the perimeter perimeter defensive? Do we have areas? Uh, do we have locked areas or entry areas where where when people are entering into the building that they go into an office before they enter a common area where students are? I, th I, th I think there's there's it, that is more of a, a building level type security system uh, or, or need or assessment that needs to be done because a lot of that is structural. A lot of that is structural, and do you have uh, I mean, I know in my prior district we had we had an incident where we had a uh, um, we had somebody in the area uh, with with a weapon and uh, buildings were on lockdown and, and sometimes those situations cause cause changes to, to be made but we we made major renovations to our buildings based on yeah. a particular incident and I think those are two different types of security yeah. but, not, but not the structural but stuff so much but the uh, the monitors and the Alarms and all yeah. of those sorts I, I of things. I think there's it, it, there is a uh, there's some some opportunities again for for uh, centrally managed uh, and, and potentially 
uh, pro provide an added level of, of, of service in terms of access to that, right. that information. I'm, and just, speed. I'm just hoping that one of these employees that we we have will be able to um, take that under their responsibility or uh, oh yeah, I think I think I think managing yeah. that that system yes consolidating it I, I think it's a because you're talking with two different vendor systems and consolidating it that that is something that would be contracted out by the security provider the ones who installed it okay all right, so you're recommending how many hires to at this time? At, at, at this time, posting one as soon as possible because we're we're really run, coming under the, the gun in terms of time, and that would be the technology service. All right, and I'd like to add that you know um, a month ago we approved the replacement for the system support um, coordinator, which was previously held by Madelanius. When Don arrived, he asked if we could just postpone that. So although it's been posted, it's just been on hold right now. So he wanted to look at everything, be here for a couple weeks, redesign things. So this is not in addition to, this is in replacement of. Correct. This is in replacement of. Um, and again, just just um, uh, putting this out there, um, so far there have been two people who are um, uh, uh, assigned uh, as a replacement for um, uh, uh, Vern's position, Don being one and the technology service manager, um, the Net56 um, te technology service well, manager. Just Well, and, and Net56 has three people here currently okay. uh, supporting us. And, and their, their role, what initially brought on, was to work on projects that needed to be addressed. Right now, they're able to do, they're, they're, with the end of the school year, once Matt left, they shifted from projects to them then supporting the day-to-day -day operations. So no progress was made on those projects. Now we're making progress on those projects. Right. And those three people will remain. So when we hire a technology services manager, we will still keep those three people over. To, to finish up the work that they were hired to do. All right. I, um, I think at, at some point, obviously right now isn't the time. I'd like to just see what the staffing, what the staffing's gonna look like and when people are being phased in and Sort of the the org chart with maybe a phase in, so we get sort of a. I I, I know it's too early for you to do it now, but a it's total. It's early. Uh, what? <laughs> I actually I have a, a document created for for your review. Yeah, so that we can get a sense of where we're going, um, it, where we're going it, it and what what we're trying to do, so we can uh, look at some of these positions that we're authorizing in context. Sure. Thank you. All right. All right. Um, thank, all right. You. Thank, uh, thank you. Um, is there any other items that we're um, discussing in new business at this well, time? Was there anything? I don't know if there was any overhanging issues with the early release plan, special development, but I just want to make make clear that the understanding now is that we are going to move forward with the administration's proposal that we saw tonight, and the other issues that were presented were going to just look at those ongoing and they'll be part of the CBA negotiations, etc. Yes, that is my understanding. I do not have any plans to revote uh, okay. our proposal. Okay. Um, I just want to make... And I don't know if there's anybody who feels we should be, um, uh, but... Um, well, I, uh, I wouldn't want to uh, rule, rule out the opportunity in the future to Well, change. you're right. It, does, it can be done... I suppose we can change this, um, you know, mid-year if there's a compelling reason to do that, um, or some new information comes to us. But I would at least like to to have our staff prepare to begin this program uh, as soon as possible. Okay. And um, you know, I, I, you know, I, I think it was a worthwhile. Discussion. I think it was a worthwhile. Um, I, I mean, I am after listening to this. I am concerned about instruction time. Yeah. You know, and but I don't think it's a problem we're going to solve now. And so I do think it was worthwhile. I think it was worthwhile making the point. Um, I think it was an important discussion to have. But uh, we have to move on. We we just have to move on. Okay. 
Thank you. I just wanted to clarify. That. Thank you for bringing. I don't it know up. if some people are sticking around because they thought there was going to be more discussion about. It. No, we're just here for the riveting discussion. That's <laughs> okay. <laughs> and technology, right? That's right. You guys should come and have a sandwich. Groupies. <laughs> well, I'm glad you find our meetings uh, so interesting that you're staying this time. Outside of that, I guess. Um, uh, we are ready uh, for a motion to uh, enter into closed session. I, I would like oh, no. to, I'm sorry, no. uh, item number M, future meeting dates. I just would like to reiterate that I was confused because it, in this particular agenda for this meeting, there is a finance committee and a regular business meeting scheduled for July 15th, which is not listed. It's listed so. differently someplace else. I saw July. Yeah, it's on the board. It's on the district website, and it's on the Is it on the policy committee agenda? It's on the policy committee agenda. Yeah. So. I thought there was an August finance committee meeting, too. Yeah. All right, as long as we're, so we are supposed to be July? We, July 15th. July and September. <coughs> And we're having July, that's going to be the Finance Committee meeting at 6 o'clock? Yeah. Yes. That's what I saw on the other agenda. And we also, which not listed, is we have a meeting Thursday, as well, you mentioned, Mary Rose, just to approve the bid for the Hauser roof. That one well, didn't get did uh, done before this agenda. Was I understand, <laughs> but, yeah, but it is, again, it's amazingly on the policy committee agenda. Ooh, ooh. Policy <laughs> that is <laughs> such a yeah, policy. up to the minute thing. <laughs> yeah. All right. All right. So we've got uh, all right. All right. somebody. What, what did somebody say about September um, meeting? Is that the is the September meetings here all listed and? Um, on this agenda? Not the committees. All right. So that's the committee for the policy committee, right? Mm -hmm. All right. So that's what's missing. Okay. Policy and finance. <laughs> and finance. What? When's our September? Hold on. I'm just, uh, when are we meeting for finance in September? I can't open it. So, uh, it's I don't oh, know. I can't open it. Oh, that's right. It's the first what Tuesday of the month, right? Right. But I thought there was one on it here. August 19th. Oh, no, I guess you're right. This August is 19th is policy. policy. Okay, right, never mind. Don't mess with policy. Sorry, I am. Okay. Someplace. I, thought. I think, Lisa, we talked about it, and then we decided we were just going to move it. Oh, that's what we did. Okay. Sorry, we September. talked about it. Right. All right, okay. so we're leaving it on its normal, um, in the September 1st. 2nd. Yeah, the first Tuesday yeah, of the month. Yeah, September 2nd. What? Okay. <laughs> okay. All right, now, um, may we have uh, enter, in, uh, thank you for catching that art, enter into the closed session for the purpose of discussing the appointment, the appointment, employment, oh, compensation, right. discipline, performance or dismissal or specific employees of the district or legal counsel for the district, including hearing testimony on a complaint lodged against an employee of the public body or legal counsel for the public body to determine its validity. Um, may I have a motion? So second. <laughs> All right. Uh, roll call, please. Randy Brackwood. Uh, aye. Lisa Gaynor. Aye. David Kadama. Aye. Arthur Perry. Aye. Mary Rose Mangia. Aye. 